This is Mr. Cleland from Cleland Maths. Today we're doing a whole ultimate three or a whole course revision for the higher maths 2023 exams. It includes everything in the whole higher exam paper, including straight lines, functions, polynomials, trigonometry, integration, differentiation, logarithms, everything at all in the whole course. Just make sure that you go through it bit by bit. Pause the video when you need to. Try the questions yourself. And good luck in your higher maths exams for 2023. I'm sure you can all do it. It's Korean National 5 Maths 2016, paper 1, question 11. Find the equation of a line passing through minus 2, 3, which is parallel to the line with equation y plus 4x equals 7. So parallel means same gradient. So I need the gradient and I point to work at the equation of a straight line. So let's work on the gradient first. So y equals minus 4x plus 7. So our gradient is minus 4 because it's parallel. Gradients are the same. Now we'll use y minus b equals mx minus a. And there's our point a and b. So we've got y minus 3 minus 4x minus minus 2. Okay. And then we can just work that out. y minus 3 is minus 4x. 4 times 2 is 8, so it's minus 8. So y equals minus 4x minus 8. Add 3 is minus 5. Higher Maths 2022, paper 1, question 1. The term of the equation of the line perpendicular to 5x plus 2y equals 7, passing through minus 1, 6. Perpendicular, which means the gradients multiply together to give minus 1. So for gradient of this line, we've got 2y equals minus 5x plus 7. So y is minus 5 over 2x plus 7 over 2. The gradient of this line is minus 5 over 2. So the gradient of our perpendicular line is equal to 2 fifths. Since m1 times m2 equals minus 1. 2, two fifths of minus 5 over 2 gives us 2 marks already. Then we can just do the equation of a straight line. y minus b equals m x minus a minus minus 1 is plus 1. So y, 5y minus 6, you might do, is 2x plus 1. Expanding our brackets, we get 5y minus 30 is 2x plus 2. So I'll leave it with 5y is equal to 2x. 2 plus 30 is 32. And you can leave it in any form you want. Y equals mx plus c. A multiples of y equals a multiple of x plus a multiple of a number. Whatever you want, really. So 5y minus 2x equals 32. And you can just leave it like that or in the, any, any other correct form for the equation. Higher Maths 2019, paper 1, question 7 had this one. The line makes a 30 degrees angle of positive direction of the x-axis. Find the equation of the line perpendicular to it, passing through 0 minus 4. So looking at the line L, the gradient is equal to the tan of 30. So the gradient of that is 1 over root 3 because it's an exact value. Now we can work out the gradient of our perpendicular. So the gradient of our perpendicular is equal to minus root 3 since m1 times m2 equals minus 1 because of perpendicular gradients. And then we can use our point. So I'll call that a and b. y minus minus 4 equals minus root 3 x minus 0 y plus 4 equals minus root 3x or y equals minus root 3x take away 4 would be fine as well and we're done there sqa higher maths 2017 paper 1 question 7 a b and c are vertices of a triangle find the equation of a median through c so there's a there's a b there's a c out here somewhere Really a bad sketch, but it is a triangle. A median cuts the opposite side in half. So we made the midpoint, always call this M. M equals 
Anyway, it equals the midpoint of A and B, so we've got minus 3 plus 7 over 2, and we've got 5 plus 9 over 2. 7 minus 3 is 4, divided by 2 is 2. 5 plus 9 is 14, divided by 2 is 7. So we get our midpoint of 2, 7. Now, our midpoint is 2, 7, so our gradient of M to C. Well, C, we've got 11 minus 7 on top, over 2 minus 2 on the bottom. 11 minus 7 is 4 over 0. Oh, wait a minute, we're dividing by 0, we can't do that. Therefore, vertical line. If you get an undefined gradient, it is a vertical line. Gradient is undefined. The equation of a vertical line is just x equals. So the equation is x equals. And you should be able to see this. The x part is 2 here. It's also 2 here. So if you ever get that, the same x, then the equation is x equals. If it's the same y, the equation would be horizontal, it would be y equals x equals 2. And we're done. x squared high math 2017, paper 2, question 1. Again, we've got a triangle showing. It says the coordinates of b are 3, 0, and c is 9 minus 2. And the broken line is a perpendicular bisector of bc. Find the equation of a perpendicular bisector. So for an equation, we need a point and a gradient. So we're going to need to find the midpoint, which is called that M. And then we can find the gradient. So for part A, the midpoint, 3 plus 9 over 2, 0 minus 2 over 2. That is equal to 6 minus 1 for our midpoint. So the gradient of BC is minus 2 take away 0 over 9 take away 3 minus 2 over 6 which is minus a third. And then, since we know of perpendicular, m, the gradient of our perpendicular is equal to 3 because m1 times m2 is minus 1. So there's a key thing there, and we've also got our point. So y minus b equals m x minus a. It was minus 1, so it became plus 1. So y Mat plus 1 is 3x minus 18, so y is 3x minus 19. And we've got our mark there. Part B. The line makes AB, makes an angle of 45 degrees with the positive direction of the x-axis, find AB. Gradient equals tan theta. Gradient equals the tan of 45 degrees, which is equal to 1. And then we have to find the equation of AB. So pick a point. Well, we're going to pick point B is 3, 0. So our point is 3, 0. Y minus 0 is 1x minus 3. So Y equals x minus 3. And we're done there. Part C, find the coordinates of the point of intersections of AB and the perpendicular bisector BC. Solve simultaneous equations. So we've got two equations. Y equals 3x minus 19. And Y equals x minus 3. So we can say that 3x minus 19 equals x minus 3. So 2x equals 19 take away 3 is 16. So x is equal to 8. Subbing that in to Y equals x minus 3. We get 8 minus 3, which is 5. The point of intersection is 8, 5, and we're done there. Do a higher maths 2022 paper 2 question 1. Find the equation of altitude for C, the median for B, and the point of intersection. So we've got minus 1, minus 1 down here. We've got 2, minus 4. And we've got 7, 3. Okay, so first of all, altitude through C, so starting at C, cutting this one at right angles, we need the gradient of A to B. So that's minus 4, minus, minus 1, uh, over 2, minus, minus 1. Minus 4, add 1 is minus 3, over 3, which is minus 1. So the gradient of our perpendicular is equal to 1, because M1 times M2 equals minus 1. 
So we've got y minus 3, is 1x minus 7. Or y equals x minus 7 add 3 is minus 4. So we've got our equation for our altitude. Part B, find the equation of the median. So median through B means we need the midpoint of A to C. So let's call the midpoint M. We've got minus 1 plus 7 over 2. And you've got minus 1 add 3 over 2. Seven minus one is six, divided by two is three. Three minus one is two, divided by two is one. So we get three, one. So we need the gradient. So using our points, three, one, and the other point we're going to need to use for our median is point B, two minus four. So we've got minus four, take away one, over two, take away three. That's minus 5 over minus 1, which is 5. y minus 1 equals 5x minus 3. So y equals 5x minus 15. Add 1 is minus 14. We've now got two equations. Chances are we're going to solve them simultaneously. Find the coordinates of the point of intersection of the altitude and the median. So we've got two equations. y equals x minus 4. And we've got y equals 5x minus 14. So we can say that 5x minus 14 equals x minus 4. That gives us 4x on this side equals minus 4 plus 14 is 10. x is 10 over 4, which is 5 over 2. Or you can write 2.5. We know that y equals x minus 4. So that means y equals 2.5 minus 4, which is equal to minus 1.5, or if you prefer, minus 3 over 2. So the point of intersection is 2.5 and minus 1.5. Okay, factors in the main is S2A Higher Maths 2017 Paper 2, Question 2. Show that x minus 1 is a factor of f of x, and then hence I'll otherwise solve f of x equal to 0. So for part A, we can use synthetic division. So we get 2x cubed minus 5x squared plus 1x plus 2. And we're showing x minus 1 is a factor, which means that 1 is a root, so I'm subbing 1 in. Drop the 2 down, 2 times 1 is 2. 2 minus 5 is minus 3. Minus 3 times 1 is minus 3. Minus 3 add 1 is minus 2. Minus 2 times 1 is still minus 2. And minus 2 add 2 is 0. So since the remainder is 0, x minus 1 is a factor of f of x. And now we have to solve it equal to zero, so we can just straight away say x minus one, that's our factor, two x squared minus three x minus two equals zero. And we need to solve that. So hopefully we can factorize the second bracket. So that'll be double brackets. And this is national five works, so revised factorizing if you need to from national five, but you've got two x and x. And I'm looking for two numbers at times to get make two, so that must be two and one. So 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3, so it goes this way, and it's going to be 2x plus 1 and x minus 2. Just a double check. Minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3, 1 times minus 2 is minus 2. So that gives a, the first bracket is x equal to 1, or 2x plus 1 equals 0, or x equals 2. Solving our middle one, we get x equal to 1, or x equals minus a half or x equals 2, and we're done there. Higher Maths 2019, paper 2, question 10 for factors and remembers, show that x plus 3 is a factor. So part A, synthetic division, we've got 3x4, 10x cubed, 1x squared, minus 8x, minus 6, plus 3, so we're subbing in minus 3. So we'll take the 3 down, we get minus 3 times 3 is 9, minus 9, 10 minus 9 is 1. 1 times minus 3 is minus 3. Minus 3 add 1 is minus 2. 
minus two times minus three is six. Six minus eight is minus two. Minus two times minus three is six. Six minus six is zero. And therefore, since the remainder equals zero, x plus three is a factor. Part B, hence all eyes factorize it fully. So we've already done a little bit of the work. We've got x plus three, and then these all drop down a power, so it's three x cubed to start with, plus x squared minus two x minus two. Okay, so we've now got a cubic to factorize, so we need to find a factor of this. You can just do that by trial and error, trying one minus one and so on. So let's start off by trying one. So for this one here, we've got 3x cubed plus 1x squared minus 2x minus 2. We try 1, and if 1 doesn't work, we try 2 and 3 until we get the remainder of 0. So 3 goes down, 3 ones are 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, 4 ones are 4, 4 minus 2 is 2, 2 ones are 2, 2 minus 2 is 0. Like again, you might have to do that a few times, and you don't have to use synthetic division each time, you can just substitute a number indirectly if you want. But I've done it in one, so I now know that since the remainder is zero, x minus one is a factor. And therefore, we now know we've got x plus three, x minus one, and we've got our three x squared plus four x plus two from the bottom bit. So now we need to check, is 3x squared plus 4x plus 2 factorizable? There's a couple of ways you can do it, trial and error, but the easiest way is to use the discriminant. If I look at, I'll do this in red, this bit here, and check b squared minus 4ac. b squared minus 4ac is 4 squared minus 4 times 3 times 2. That's 16 minus 12 times 2 is 24, which is negative 8. That means no real solutions. Final answer is x plus 3, x minus 1, 3x squared plus 4x plus 2, and we're done there. Hi, SQA, Higher Maths, 2022, paper 1, question 13, part A, show that x plus 2 is a factor of x cubed minus 2x squared minus 20x take away 24, part 2, then solve f of x equals 0, and then it shows you a graph of f of x, and it tells you that f of x minus k is k greater than 0, has a station point at 1, 0, you can state the value k, we'll get to that in a bit, but let's start dealing with our showing the factor of a cubic. So, x plus 2 is a factor. There's two ways to do this. We could just substitute minus 2 into it, or we can use synthetic division with minus 2, whichever one you prefer. I will do the most common way that most people do it, which is synthetic division. So a reminder of how that works. We put minus 2 on the outside, and then the coefficients of our function. So 1x cubed minus 2x squared minus 20x minus 24. 1 just drops straight down, and then we've got 1 times minus 2, which is minus 2, adding them together to get minus 4, minus 4 times 2 is 8, adding them together to get minus 12, minus 12 times minus 2 is 24, adding them together to get 0. And we get a mark at that point for using minus 2 in the synthetic division, so there's a mark. Let's move on to our second mark. So we need to complete the division and interpret the result. So we've completed the division, but we're not actually saying anything. We now need to say that since the remainder equals zero, that therefore x plus two is a factor of f of x. And that gives us our second mark there for completing the division and also making our statement 
If you had done it the other way by substituting minus 2 in directly, then you would still get an answer of 0, but you would say that since f of minus 2 equals 0, x plus 2 is a factor. So it's the same way. Okay, let's move on to part 2. Hence, or otherwise solve f of x equal to 0. Now, if you, this is where the power of synthetic division comes in. If you've already done synthetic division for part A, you already know this. If you haven't done it for part A, then you're going to have to divide through. But let's just assume that we're doing it this way. So for part 2, we have got this whole bit, x squared minus 4x minus 12, is our factor. So we now know that x plus 2 is a factor. So f of x equals x plus 2 times x squared minus 4x minus 12. And obviously, like I said in part 1, if you had just substituted minus 2 in, then you'd either have to do synthetic division at this stage, or alternatively, if you do polynomial division, if you know how to do that, you can do it that way. But assuming we've done this, we've got the quadratic factor, so we get a mark for stating this point here. That's our third mark. Then we need to solve it, so we make it equal to 0. So we've got x plus 2 x squared minus 4x minus 12 equals 0. That's just staying where it is because we've already done that, but we need to factorise our quadratic. So we've got x and x. Two numbers at times to make 12, but add or take away to make 4. It must be 6 and 2. And since our final result is negative, then one of them is negative and one is positive, just getting them right the right way around. We've got minus 6 plus 2 is minus 4. So that equals zero. If we get to that point, we get our two brackets, we get another mark there. Or alternatively, if you forgot how to factorise or couldn't do the factorising, if you had substituted into the quadratic formula correctly, which would be four plus or minus square root of minus four squared, take away four times one times minus 12, all over two times one, you would get a mark instead for that. And then your final mark is just for working that out to get your factors. So we've now got x plus 2 equals 0, or x plus 2 equals 0, or x minus 6 equals 0, so x equals minus 2, or x equals minus 2, or x equals 6. So we get our final solution of minus 2 and 6 for our other remaining factors, because hence otherwise solve f of x equals 0. We've already got 1, so our other one for getting minus 2 and 6. And since it's a repeated factor, we could just say that x equals minus 2 or x equals 6, just to be clear. Minus 2 and 6 give you your final answer. Mark. The graph of f of x minus k has a stationary point at 1, 0. State the value of k. We know that this must be minus 2 because it's crossing the axis there. And this must be 6. Now, if this has a stationary point at 1, 0, that means that this must have shifted along to the number 1. So there's 1 there. It's shifted to the right by 3, and therefore, since it's shifted to the right by 3, k equals 3, because it's x minus k. So it's x minus 3. So k is 3, and we get a mark just for working that out. So there's our final mark for this question. SQA, hi, I'm asked 2016, paper 1, question 15, identify a polynomial from its roots. So the diagram below shows the graph of f of x, which is k, x minus a, x minus b squared. Find the values of a, b, and k. There's one of my roots there. And there's the other root there. That's a repeated root. And I know that because it's a turning point and a root. So that one is my b, and the other one is my a. So I can immediately say for part a, f of x equals k times x minus 4, x plus 5 squared. And then we can use the point 1, 9 to work out our k. x equals 1, y equals 9. So we get 9 equals 1, k times 1 minus 4, 1 plus 5 all squared. So 9 equals k times minus 3. 1 plus 5 is 6. 
six sixes, 36. So nine equals minus 108k. So k is nine over minus 108, it's minus 12. So we've got k is minus a 12. We've got a equals four and b was equal to minus five, remember, from our, our roots, four and minus five. So we're done there. Part B says, for the function g of x equals f of x minus d, where d is positive, determine the range of values for d so that g of x has exactly one real root. Okay, let's have a look at this. If it's got one real root, it only crosses the x-axis at one point. So this is going to move down, so that makes it go, but it's still going up. So this turning point has to go underneath here. So that the only places, place it crosses is when it first initially drops down. Then it goes up and it's going to turn before it hits there and go back down. Well, that length is 9, so D must be greater than 9, and it's as simple as that. So it's just a good way of working that out by looking. So for part B, I just write D is greater than 9, and we're done there. Twenty twenty two higher maths paper one question eleven was express two x squared plus twelve x plus twenty three in the form p x plus q squared plus r. So now was a higher maths complete the square question. So there's a couple of ways to do this. Let's go for the most common way. Um, you've got two x squared plus twelve x plus twenty three. You want a p, so you're going to have to take two out as a common factor between the first two terms. So you could write two bracket x squared plus six x and then you've still got your plus 23 on the end. And that would be a mark for that. Okay, your second mark, completing the square on this. We we'll have to know that we then do two bracket, half the middle term, so x plus three squared. And then we need to, that's all in big brackets, of course. We need to immediately take away three squared. We've still got plus 23. So if you had got this part here, if you'd written x plus 3 squared times 2, you would have got a mark there. We've got 2 x plus 3 squared minus 9 plus 23. So that's 2 x plus 3 squared. 2 times 9 is 18, so minus 18 plus 23 which gives us a final answer of 2x plus 3 squared. 23 take away 18 is 5, so plus 5. So if you can get your final mark by following your working through, you get your final answer there. So that's method one, that's one way to do it. Okay, another optional method that you could use for this, but not often I've seen taught, is to start from this point and expand it and then equate the terms. I'll show you that method now. So if I've got px plus q squared, that's p times x squared plus 2qx plus q squared, and that is now plus r. Following that through a little bit, I get px squared plus 2pqx plus pq squared plus r. If you got that far, you get a mark at this stage for that for this method and then equating the terms so this obviously equals 2x squared plus 12x plus 23 so we should be able to see that the only the coefficient of x squared here is 2 and the coefficient of x squared here is p so p is obviously equal to 2 we can see right here that p immediately equals 2 and similarly, the coefficient of x in the first is 2pq, and that equals 12. But we can immediately work out, since p is 2, that means that 4q equals 12, and q equals 3. And finally, we can see that pq squared r is the constant, plus r, sorry, equals 23. But we already know that p is 2 and q is 3, so substituting that in, we get 2 times 9, which is 18, plus r equals 23, so r equals 5 in this case. 
if you got PQ equals 2, 2PQ two equals 12, and PQ squared R plus R equals 23, if you had written down those equations, you would have got a mark. So we should have written all of them, the top lines, and then working all of them out and writing it in completed square form gets you your final mark. So you can't just work them all out. You have to then say what the answer actually is, which is 2 x plus 3 squared, because q is 3, plus your 5, because r is 5, for your final mark. And there's your three marks in that way. Okay, the discriminant, x squared higher maths 2019, paper 1, question 2. The equation x squared plus k minus 5x plus 1 has equal roots. Determine the values, possible values of k. Well, if it's got equal roots, that means that we write for equal roots. That implies b squared minus 4ac equals 0. So our a is the number in front of x squared. Our b is k minus 5, the number in front of x. And our c is just 1. So for b squared minus 4ac, we get k minus 5 squared minus 4 times 1 for a times 1 for c equals 0. Expanding k minus 5 all squared gives me k squared. Minus 5 times 2 is minus 10, so minus 10k. 5 fives is 25. And then we've got 4 times 1 times 1 is 4 equals 0. So that's k squared minus 10k. 25 minus 4 is 21 equals 0. And if we're lucky, that will factorise. So we've got k and k. 7 threes is 21 and 7 and 3 make 10. So it's definitely 7 and 3. Minus 7 minus 3 is minus 10. So k equals 3 or k equals 7. And we're done there. Question 2 says... Determine the equation 2x squared minus 8x plus 4 minus p equals 0 has two real and distinct roots. Determine the range of values of 4p. So two real and distinct roots means that the determinant, and I was b squared minus 4ac, has to be strictly greater than 0. So in this case, a is 2 b is minus a, and this whole thing here is c for minus p. So we'll just substitute that in. So we've got minus a squared minus 4 times 2 times 4 minus p is greater than 0. 64 minus 8 bracket 4 minus p is greater than 0. So 64, 8 fours is 32. 8 times p plus 8p, because minus times a minus, is greater than 0. That gives us 32 plus 8p is greater than 0. Take the 32 to the other side, we get 8p is greater than negative 32. So p must be greater than negative 32 over 8. 8 fours is 32, so p is greater than negative 4. And we're done. Okay, looking at quadratic inequalities. S squared higher maths 2015, paper 1, question 8. A, B, C, D is a rectangle with lengths x and x minus 2 as shown. If the area is less than 15, determine the range of values of x. Well, area is length times height. So I'll just write that down, or length times breadth if you prefer. So our length is x, and that's x minus 2. And it says that that area has to be less than 15. So I just write x, x minus 2 is less than 15 to set up my inequality. Expanding my brackets, I get x squared minus 2x is less than 15. I've got a quadratic, so I need to take the 15 to the other side. And we need to then find out the roots and draw a graph to see where it's less than 0. So looking at the roots of this, we've got x squared minus 2x minus 15. If that's factorizable, hopefully, we get x and x, 5 and 3, minus 5 plus 3 is minus 2, so roots are x equal to minus 3 or x equal to 5. So that means we can draw a quick sketch at the side. Minus 3 is over here and 5 is over here somewhere. It's positive x squared 
So our quadratic looks something like that, and it just has to be a quick sketch. Now we're looking to see where it's less than zero, where it's less than zero below the x-axis. So that is in between these two numbers, minus three is less than x is less than five. But we need to be careful with this question because it is about the area of a rectangle, so we can't have a negative length. X must be. Let's have a look. We've got x minus 2 is our smallest, so it has to be bigger than 2. Or the breadth would be negative. And therefore, our actual answer is 2 is less than x is less than 5. We need to be very careful with ones where it's in context. SQA Higher Maths 2019 Paper 1 Question 12. Two functions are defined as f and g. You have to determine f of g of x. So let's do this. Question A, f of g of x. Well, that equals f of, well, g of x is 5 minus x. So I'm substituting 5 minus x every time I see an x in f of x. So that is 1 over the square root of 5 minus x. And we're done there. Part B, state the range of hours which f of g of x is undefined. Well, it's undefined when either this is 0, because you can't divide by 0, or when 5 minus x is, is less than 0 because you can't square root a negative number to get a real value. So we can just write that undefined when, well, 5 minus x has to be less than or equal to zero, otherwise it's undefined. In other words, five minus six has to be bigger than zero. So we can then just solve that for x, take the x over to the other side, you get five is less than or equal to x, or to write that in a nicer way, x is greater than or equal to five. And make sure you've written undefined when, okay? Okay, composite functions. SQA Higher Maths 2017 paper one, question one. F and G are defined as F of x is five x, G of x is two cos x. Evaluate F of G of zero. Okay, there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can find f of g of x, or you can work out g of 0 and shove it into f. I'm going to do it by doing f of g of x. So f of g of x is equal to f of 2 cos x. So every time I see an x in f, I put 2 cos x. So that means I've got 5 times 2 cos x, which is 10 cos x. And therefore, f of g of 0, subbing 0 into this, you get 10 times the cos of 0. The cos of 0 is 1, so that means you've got 10 times 1, which is just 10. And we're done there. Find an expression for g of f of x for part b. So g of f of x means every time I see a function in g, I write f of x, which is 5x, so it's g of 5x, and g is 2 cos x, so that's 2 cos 5x. And we're done there. Inverse functions s to be higher maths 2017, paper 1, question 6. The function h is defined as x cubed plus 7. Define, determine the expression for the inverse function of h. So I can just write y equals x cubed plus 7 and make x a subject, so that means that x cubed is y minus 7, so x is the cube root of y minus 7, and therefore the inverse function of h is equal to the cube root of x minus 7. Again, do not be tempted to write at this stage y equals the cube root of x minus 7, or you'll lose a mark, because y is this, it's not that. So just watch a little bit of notational thing there. SQA Higher Maths 2022 Paper 1 Question 3 was a function h is defined as h of x equals 4 plus a third of x, where x is a member of real numbers, and find the inverse function h to the negative 1x. And this is worth 3 marks. 
This one is a couple of methods you could use, so I'll go through both methods in case you use an alternative method or prefer an alternative method. So let's look at method one. Let's call it here method one. For method one to get your first mark, you would save it h of the inverse function of x equals x. You can get a mark for knowing that if you take h of the inverse, you always, the composite function, you always get the answer x. So there's one mark there just for writing that down. Then for your second mark, substituting into h, you'll get 4 plus 1 third h to the minus 1 of x. And that still equals x. So there's your second mark if you're using composite functions. And then for your third mark, the inverse function, the subject of that. So we'll need to do some work on that, first of all. So we've got one third of the inverse function equals x, take away four, times in three by three then, the inverse function equals three times the whole of x minus four. And we can leave it in that form to get your final mark, or you could have went on and expanded the brackets, but there's nothing to do that. So there's your first method. And let's go through method two for the same question. Okay, so method two is much more common I've seen in the high schools used, is where you say that y equals h of x. And that implies that x equals the inverse function of y. In other words, writing y equals the inverse, the function, if you make x a subject, that gives you the inverse function, okay? So we have got y equals four plus a third x in this case and then we would get a mark for starting to rearrange this so you could get a mark for doing y minus 4 equals a third x that's a mark there or alternatively if you prefer to multiply 3 by 3 first or you could have 3y equals 12 plus x if that's the way you prefer to go I would do it the first way but that's the alternative way. Continuing on with the way that I've done it, that's your first mark, then expressing x, making x a subject. So from here, we're going to times through by 3. So we've got 3y minus 4 equals x, or x equals 3y minus 4. There's your second mark there. And then you have to explicitly state what the inverse function is to get your final mark. So you have to then say that your inverse function of y is equal to 3y minus 4. And so for your final mark, your inverse function of x must be 3x minus 4. And there's our final mark there. Now, just a little notes on like, where would the SQA say you can't get marks? Let's look at method two to start with since we're on it. We can start off just by writing this and you will get your first mark. If you, don't, if you, had, if you forgot to write this, we would not take a mark off. Similarly, at mark three, we would accept h inverse function of x is 3x to minus four without you writing this statement first. So if you just jump straight from here to here, that would be fine also. Also, what you would actually get a mark for if you had made a mistake is if you had kept it as y instead of x, we would, be, we would be quite happy with that and give you the mark anyway, the benefit of a doubt. What we would not allow you to get a mark for, to be very clear though, is if you look y equals 3 bracket x minus 4. You have to state it's an inverse function h minus 1. And if you had actually done all this for some reason and not shown any working, not sure why you do that, but if you did in this case, we would actually give you free, free give you a benefit of the doubt on this question. For method one, if you go four plus a third h to minus one, if you just jump straight to here, we would give you both marks. We'd be fine with that as well. And of course, again, if you just jump straight to here and just got the answer, we'd give you all three marks. So there's your allocations of marks for this question. Method one and method two. Logarithmic graphs. Let's go to Highmaster 2015, paper one, question 13. 
The function f of x is 2 to the x plus 3 is defined on r, the set of real numbers. The graph of equation y equals f of x passes through 1b and cuts the y-axis that q is shown. What is the value of b? Well, it passes through 1b, so I can just sub 1 in. So for part a, we've got f of x is equal to 2 to the x plus 3. So at x equal to 1, we're going to say that f of x equals 2 to the power of 1 plus 3, which is 2 plus 3, which is 5. So just to answer the question, b equals 5. And we're done there. Part B says copy the diagram above and sketch the inverse function and then write down the coordinates of the images of P and Q. What it means by the images of P and Q is what does P and Q become in the inverse function? So this is an exponential, so the inverse function is a log. So we need to reflect that in the line y equals x. So let's just go ahead and do that. So I've copied the diagram below. So we already know that P is 1B, which we've just worked out is 1, 5. And then let's work out our y-intercept for this graph. So that is when x equals 0. So f of x, which was 2 to the power of x plus 3. That's 2 to the power of 0 plus 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. So we get 0, 4. We need to reflect in the line y equals x. So drawing a y equals x sign. So 0, 4 becomes along 4, 0. And 1, 5 becomes 5, 1. And we've got an exponential curve like so. That's the inverse function of x. So that's part 1 done. And then for part 2, oh, I've already done the work for it. The image of P and Q, we've got 4, 0. And we've got 5, 1. And we're done there. Part C says... R311 lies on the graph of equation y equals f of x. Find the coordinates of the image of, of R on the graph of equation y equals 4 minus f of x plus 1. So writing down f of x again. f of x, remember, was 2 to the power of x plus 3. And we know that the R lies on this, which is 3, 11. So our new equation is y equals 4 minus f of x plus 1. So what does that mean? Well, let's just take a few notes. In here, means we move left by 1. Minus f of x means we reflect in the x-axis. And you can think of this, that's like plus 4, so move up by 4. If it helps, you can rewrite this as minus f of x plus 1, and then add the 4 in the end, and you might be able to see that better. So that means we've got our r, which was 3.11. So doing the things in the correct order, we, we apply our reflection and then we move the left, and then we move up. So our reflection, minus f of x plus 1, 3, 11 becomes 3, minus 11, because it drops down underneath. And then that goes to moving left by 1, so 3 becomes 2, so 2 minus 11. And then finally, we need to move up by 4, so we get 2, minus 7 as our final answer. Now, if you're really struggling with that, one way to do it is to go back to the original graph and actually draw it, reflect it, move it to the left, move it up, and note that point moving around. Twenty twenty two high maths paper one question ten had this diagram of a cubic function f of x and it had stationary points at zero three and four zero and with the sketch graph of two f of x and one. So what's it asking us here? It's asking us to scale it up by a factor of two, so times by two, and then move the graph up by one. So let's do that on a diagram. We have have just drawn this very small here. You can't really see it, but that is the actual question. But it's just so that I can refer to it as we are going. So I've drawn myself a little uh, coordinate grid. 
and we can start off by looking at the points. So the first point we start off with is 0, 3. And we have got to times it by 2. So 0, 3 becomes 3 times 2 is 6. But then we move it up by 1, so it becomes 7. So our first point is 0, 7. And we get a mark for that. And our second point is we're times them by 2, but it's along 4 up 0. So 0 times 2 is still 0. But then we add 1, so it goes along 4 up 1. So we can note that point is 4, 1. And the shape of the graph is exactly the same as it was before. So we just carefully draw a nice curve turning here. And we can even label it y equals 2f of x plus 1. So our marks for this, you get one mark for a vertical scaling of a factor of two, which you can see from the graph. By that, we can see that you've done, you've times by two somehow. You get another mark for adding one, so we can see you've moved up by one. You're getting this from the turning points, really. And then transformations applied in the correct order. So that's the final mark for doing it completely correctly, essentially, because you could have thought, well, we need to add one first, then times by two. Now, if you had done that, 4, 0 would become 4, 1, which would become 4, 2. You would still get a mark for doing both of those things with 4, 2. Similarly, 0, 3 would become 0, 4, which would become 0, 8. It would be obvious you had added 1 in times by 2, but in the wrong order. So you get 2 out of 3 in that case. Part B says, state the coordinates of the stationary points of the graph at y equals a half x. So let's start off with the original graph again. So we're saying that x is being halved so what does that mean it means that we can work out that 0 3 would turn into 0 3 still because of half of 0 or doubling 0 still gives you 0 so 0 3 is still 0 3 that makes no difference now the only thing that's changing is the x this one was 4 0 but i want it to be 4 so if i double 4 i get 8 because a half of 8 is 4 so it must be 8 0 as well and you just get a mark for actually working that out where no real working required there, just for stating it. So, SQA High Maths 2016, paper 2, question 4, had this circle question. Circle C1 and C2 have these equations. And write down the centres and radius of the circles. So, for part A, remember looking at the start of our exam paper, we are told quite a few things, but essentially, Minus 5 and 6 is the centre here. And for circle 2, well, we're going to have to do some work. So we call the number in front of x 2g. So if I say 2g equals minus 6, and the number in front of y we say is 2f, well, there's no y term, so that's 0. So g is minus 3, and f is 0. And the centre is defined as minus g minus f, so that is going to be 3 and 0. The radius of circle 1 is just the square root of 9, which is 3. And to get the radius of circle 2, remember, it's the square root of f squared plus g squared, so 0 squared plus 3 squared minus c. Well, c is minus 16, so plus 16. So that's the square root of 9 plus 16 square root of 25, which is 5. Part B says, show that C1 and C2 do not intersect. Well, if we can work out the distance between the two centres, and then work out the distance of the, the two radiuses together, if the two radiuses add up to less than the distance between the centres, then they don't intersect. So our distance between C1 and C2 well, that's just Pythagoras, so it's minus 5 minus 3 squared plus 6 minus nothing squared, distance formula. So that is the square root of minus 8 squared plus 6 squared. That's the square root of 64 plus 36. Square root of 100, which equals 10. So there's the distance between the centres. Sum of the radius of the radii. Well, that's just 3 plus 5, which equals 8. So since 
R1 plus R2 is less than the distance between the centers. The circles do not intersect. And we're done there. Let's go higher maths, paper one, question three. Circle C1 has this equation and C2 has center four minus two. The radius of C2 is equal to the radius of C1. Find the equation of circle C2. So we have got our equation up here. And just remember, form our equation, x squared plus y squared minus 2x minus 2y minus 26 equals 0. You're given at the start of the exam paper the radius. The radius is quoted as equaling the square root of g squared plus f squared minus c. And your g and your f, well, this is called 2g and 2f. So 2g is minus 6, and 2f is minus 2. So my g is minus 3, and my f is minus 1. So my radius is equal to minus 3 squared plus minus 1 squared. Take away c, but it's a minus already, so plus 26. So that means that going down here, my radius is equal to the square root of 9 plus 1 plus 26. That's the square root of 36, which is equal to 6. So we've got our radius, and we know the circle center is 4 minus 2. So we know the equation of C2 must equal x minus 4 squared plus y plus 2 squared equals 36. And we're done there. Let's go higher maths 2018, paper 1, question 4. The point k lies in the circle with this equation. Find the equation of a tangent to the circle at k. Tangent meets a radius at right angles. So we need to find the centre of our circle. So we've got it in expanded form. So from the start of the exam paper, we are told that x squared plus y squared plus 2gx plus 2fx plus c equals 0 is the equation of a circle where the centre is equal to minus g minus f and the radius is equal to the square root of g squared plus f squared minus c. So looking up at our equation, the number in front of f, 2g is minus 12. And the number in front of y, 2f is minus 6. So that gives me g is minus 12 divided by 2, minus 6, and it gives me f is minus 6 divided by 2, minus 3. So our centre is just simply 6, 3. Once we've got our centre, we can find the gradient between our centre. Let's just call our centre C. So the gradient between C and K is minus 5 take away 3 on the top and 8 take away 6 on the bottom. Minus 5 take away 3 is minus 8 over 2, which is minus 4. So the gradient of our perpendicular equals a quarter since m1 times m2 equals minus 1. So our point is 8 minus 5 for k. So we can use y minus b, y plus 5 equals m x minus a, which is 8. Times the three by 4, we get 4 times y plus 5 equals x minus 8. So 4y plus 20 is x minus 8, or to leave it in a nice way, 4y minus x equals minus 28 would be a fine answer. If you prefer y equals, you can divide through by 4 to get y equals a quarter of x, and then minus 28 divided by 4 is minus 7, if you prefer. Higher Maths 2019, paper 2, question 15. A circle has centre 8, 12. P, 5, 13 lies on the circle as shown on the outside. Find the equation of the tangent at P. Now, if we want to find the equation of the tangent, if it's about circles, a tangent meets a radius at right angles. So we can find the gradient of the radius, and then m1 times m2 equals minus 1. So we'll just do that. Let me just draw that picture in so it's really clear. That's a right angle. So the gradient of C to P, or P to C, is 12, 13 take away 12, 
over 5 take away 8. That's 1 over minus 3 or minus a third. So the gradient of our perpendicular equals 3 since m1 times m2 equals minus 1. And we've got our point. Our point is 513. So it's just now straight line work. y minus b equals mx minus a. So y minus 13 equals 3x minus 5. Y minus 13 is 3x minus 15, so y equals 3x minus 2. And we're done there. But B says the tangent of P meets the y-axis at point T. State the coordinates of T. Part B, I Remember the equation of our tangent is 3x minus 2. So our, it meets the y-axis when x is 0, in other words, minus 2. So the point is just equal minus 2. And we're done there. So part B2 says find the equation of a circle that passes through the points C, P and T. So if we've got the picture of it here again, we've got C, P and T, and we're saying that there's some circle that goes through all three of these points, a bigger circle. Now, if I've drawn a, I've not drawn an accurate sketch of this, but we know that this is a right angle it's meant to be at he, P. Now that only happens in a circle, when we make a tri triangle, and that would be the diameter. So we now know, essentially, that CT is the diameter. And therefore, we can work out, <coughs> we can work out the midpoint of C and T. So the midpoint of C to T, well, we've got 8, and then that is, remember, t is 0 minus 2. So it's 8 plus 0 divided by 2. And it is 12 minus 2 divided by 2. So that's 8 over 2 is 4. And we've got 10 over 2, which is 5. So we know our midpoint now is 4, 5. Now we need to know the radius. So we can do the distance between c and t. Remember, t is 0 minus 2. So the distance from c to t equals the square root of 4 minus 0 squared is 4 squared and then 5 minus minus 2 squared is 7 squared so it's 4 squared is 16 plus 49 that is the square root of 65 and therefore the equation of a circle that goes through these points is simply x minus 4 squared plus y minus 5 squared equals 65, root 65 squared. And we're done there. The intersection of lines and circles again. The line 3x intersects the circle with equation x minus 2 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals 25. Find the coordinates of the point of intersection. So if it intersect, it means we're solving them simultaneously to see these points. So y equals 3x is our first equation. And when we'll write down our circle equation, x minus 2 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals 25. So to solve these simultaneously, we use substitution. We know that y is 3x, so we'll replace the y with 3x in this equation. So we've got x minus 2 squared plus 3x minus 1 squared equals 25. Multiplying out our brackets to get a quadratic then, we've got x squared minus 4x plus 4 for the first bracket. And then we've got 3 3's is 9x squared, 3 1's is 3, double that is 6, so minus 6x plus 1. And then I'll just take away 25 and make it equal to 0 because I'm going to get a quadratic. If you're struggling with multiplying out these brackets, you can just take your time and multiply them out any way you want. So we've got x squared and 9x squared is 10x squared minus 10x. 4 plus 1 is 5 minus 25 is negative 20 equals 0. 10 is a common factor. x squared minus x minus 2. So 10, hopefully it's factorizable. 2 and 1. Um, we want to get minus 1, so it's minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1. Minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. So x equals minus 1 or x equals 2. We've got our x point, now we need to get our y point. So when y equals 3x, x equal to minus 1, 
y equals minus 3, the point is minus 1 minus 3, and for y equal to 3x, where x equals 2, y equals 6, so our point is 2, 6. There's our two points of contact. And we're done there. Find the line y equals 3x plus 7 and x for circle x squared plus y squared minus 4x minus 6y minus 7. At the points P and Q, find the coordinates of P and Q. So I need to substitute y equals 3x plus 7 into it because they intersect. So part A, try to find the points of intersection. So I'm going to sub y equals 3x plus 7 into the circle. So then I see a y, I'm going to write 3x plus 7. So I've got x squared plus 3x plus 7 all squared minus 4x minus 6. 3x plus 7 minus 7 must equal 0. So that gives me x squared plus 9x squared. 3 7s is 21. Double that is 42x. 7 7s is 49. Minus 4x minus 18x. Minus 42, minus 7 equals 0. So we've got in total 10x squared. We've got 42 minus 18 minus 4, which is plus 20x. And then we've got 49 minus 42 minus 7, that's 0. So that equals 0. So we can, we can factorise that nice and easy. 10x is a common factor, obviously x plus 2 equals 0, so that gives me two solutions, x equals 0 or x equals minus 2. To get our y's, we can just substitute them in, so at x equals 0, y equals 3 times 0 plus 7, which equals 7. So the first point we get is 0, 7, and at x equals minus 2, we get y equals 3 times minus 2 plus 7, Minus 6 plus 7, that's 1. So our second point is minus 2, 1. So there's our P and there's our Q. Well, part B says PQ is the tangent to a second smaller circle. It's concentric with the first to determine the equation of the smaller circle. So let's put some information onto this circle. First of all, the centre of the circle. Well, that's just going to be 2, 3, half and half. Switch the signs. We already know the coordinates of point P and Q. 0, 7 and minus 2, 1. Now if I draw this in, if I draw a radius going straight out to the bigger circle, well, it meets this chord at right angles and cuts it in half. So I can find this midpoint. So the mid of... P and Q, well that's just 0 plus minus 2 over 2, and 7 plus 1 over 2. Minus 2 over 2 is minus 1, 8 over 2 is 4. So our midpoint is minus 1, 4. So now we have the midpoint, and we have the centre, we can work out the radius using the distance formula. We have got the square root of x2 minus x1 squared, so 2 minus minus 1 squared, plus y2 minus y1 squared, so that's 3 minus 4 squared, so that gives me the square root of 2 minus minus 1 is 3 squared, which is 9, plus minus 1 squared, which is 1 giving you a radius of the square root of 10. So our equation is as x minus 2 squared plus y minus 3 squared equals root 10 squared, which is 10. Next way, higher maths 2018, paper 2, question 12. Circle 1 has the equation x minus 13 squared plus y plus 14 squared equals 100. And circle 2 has this equation. Write down the coordinates of the centre of circle C1. Well, that's nice and easy. C1 centre equals 13 minus 4. Part 2 says 
the center C1 lies on the circumference of C2, show that C is minus 455. So we've got our equation x squared plus y squared plus 14x minus 22y plus c equals 0. But we know that this center lies on it. So if it lies on it, it means if I sub in 13 and minus 4 for x and y, that has to equal 0, otherwise it wouldn't lie on it. So we can just do that. So we get 13 squared plus minus 4 squared plus 14 times 13 minus 22 times minus 4 plus c equals 0. Bit of maths to do, but this was a calculator paper, so you just get your calculator out and work it out. You get 169 plus 16 plus 182 plus 88 plus c equals 0. So then adding up all the numbers, you get 455 plus c equals 0, and therefore c is negative 455 as required. Okay, part B says the line joining the centres of the circles intersects C1 at point P. Determine the ratio in which P divides the line joining the centres of the circle and then find the coordinates of P. So the radius of C1 we already know is equal to 10. And we can work out the radius of our second circle by using the formula at the start of the exam paper but I remember it is the square root of g squared plus f squared. So g is going to be 7 and f is minus 11 minus c, which is in this case 4, 5, 5, so plus c. So that gives us the square root of 6, 2, 5. Just put it in a calculator which is 25. So we've got our two radiuses. We know the, this radius here from C1 to P is 10. We know the radius from here all the way over to here is 25, so that must be 15, because 15 and 10 make 25. So the ratio is dividing, P is dividing the line is simply 15 to 10, which we can simplify to 3 to 2. And we're done there. Part 2, hence or otherwise determine the coordinates of P. So the centre of our first circle is minus 7, 11. And then join another line. I draw a right angle triangle here. We know that the distance here must be 13 minus minus 7, which is 20. And we know that the distance up the side is 11 minus minus 4, which is 15. And P is 3 fifths of the way along. So I just need to do 3 fifths of 15. Nine and three fifths of twenty, which is twelve. Minus seven add twelve is five. And for a y part, we're starting up at eleven and we're going down nine. Eleven minus nine is two, so we get five two, and we're done there. P is the centre of a third circle C three. C two touches C three internally. Determine the equation of C3. So it's best to probably draw a picture for this one. So there's our picture, we've got original picture, and then we've got this new circle, and it says that C2 touches C3 internally, so it's touching it at one point inside the circle. And we have to determine the equation of C3. Remember, P is the center of this big, massive circle, okay? So our center, we already know, is 5, 2. And we need to work out our radius. But we already know some information from what we've already worked out previously. We know that the radius of this big circle here is 25. And we know that the distance between here and here was 15. Because it was 10 over here as well. 10 and 15 make 25. So if we know that the, this is 25, and from here to here is 15, then the radius of our new circle is 25 plus 15, 
which is equal to 40. So now we've got everything we need. We can just write down our equation of our circle, x minus 5 squared plus y minus 2 squared equals 40 squared. Working out 40 squared, you get x minus 5 squared plus y minus 2 squared equals 1600. And we're done. Okay, some unusual circle questions. 2015, paper 1, question 14. A circle with this equation meets the coordinate axis exactly three points. What is the value of k? So drawing a quick sketch of this, we've got 2g is minus 12 and 2f is minus 10. So g is equal to minus 6 and f is equal to minus 5. So our centre is equal to 6, 5. So along 6 up 5 somewhere is the centre of our circle touches the coordinate axis at exactly three points. So it could, if this is the centre here, it could touch here, but then it would, only, it would have to touch at this point to come back up here. So if we draw a picture of that, we get something like this. That would be one option. And this is just a, a wee quick sketch to get an idea of what's happening. But also, we could have that, we could have the y-axis be a tangent. So we could also alternatively have something like this is a tangent, but then it dips under. And this is a 0.65. So that's our two options for this question. So we'll just look at option one and option two. So let's look at option one. So let's look at the radius. We know it has zero, zero. So the radius of this is just going to be six minus zero squared, which is six squared, plus five minus zero squared, which is five squared. Six sixes is 36 plus 25, that's just the square root of 6 to 1. So in option 1, we just get the square root of 6 to 1, so we know our radius is the square root of 6 to 1. But from the equation, g squared plus f squared minus c equals the radius. So we know that g and f is 6 and 5, but we've got c as k. So from the equation, we also get our radius is equal to the square root of 6 squared plus 5 squared minus k because c is k, that is the square root of 6 to 1 minus k, and therefore k must be 0, that should be pretty obvious. So for option 1, k is 0. Now let's look at option 2. So in option 2, from the equation, our radius will still equal the square root of 6 to 1 minus k, but if we've got some points here, so this is along 6, so we know that that's the point zero six. Our radius is 6, in other words, so we know that the square root of 6 to 1 minus k must equal 6. Square on both sides, we get 6 to 1 minus k equals 36. So that means that k equals 6 to 1 minus 36, which is 25. So there's our two options for k. k could be 25 or k could be 0, depending on what exactly is happening in this, uh, this question. Okay, unusual circle questions. SQA, hi, I'm Av, 2019, paper 1, question 16. Had this one. P is the point with coordinates 4k, and C is the centre of the circle with this equation. Show the distance between P and C is given by square root of k squared plus 4k plus 13. So part A... We've got our points, 4 and k, and the centre of our circle is equal to, well, let's have a look. We've got 1 minus 2. So we can work out the distance between them. That is going to be the square root of the difference in the x's, 4 minus 1 squared, plus the difference in the y's, k minus minus 2 squared. Tidying that up, we get the square root of 3 squared plus k plus 2 squared. That equals the square root of 9 plus k squared plus 4k plus 4, which equals the square root of k squared plus 4k plus 13, as required. Part B says, hence I'll always find the range of values of k such that p lies outside the circle. So let's draw a little picture for this. We've got a circle, and the centre of that circle is 1 minus 2. And we can look to see what the radius is. We know the radius is 5, the square root of 25. 
So that distance is 5, that's our radius. So if P is outside the circle, then clearly the distance between the centre and P must be bigger than 5. It has to be over 5. So we can then just say that the square root of k squared plus 4k plus 13 is greater than 5. And we can go from there. That's because our radius, remembers 5. So quadratic inequality, square both sides, k squared plus 4k plus 13 is greater than 25. Taking the 25 over, we get k squared plus 4k minus 12 is greater than 0. And this is a quadratic inequality, so we examine the roots. So looking at our roots, we've got k squared plus 4k minus 12 is equal to 0. Double brackets, we get k and k, 6 and 2 plus 6 minus 2 is 4. So our roots happen at k equal to 2, or k equals minus 6. Drawing a quick sketch then of that graph, we get 2 is over here somewhere, minus 6 over here. It's a positive k squared, so it is a happy face. We don't need the turning point or anything, because we're just looking to see when is this bigger than 0. Well, it's bigger than 0 above the x-axis, so it's over this side, it's always bigger than 0, and over this side, it's always bigger than 0 as well. So our final answer is k is less than minus 6, or k is bigger than 2. And we're done there. SQA Higher Maths 2015 Paper 1 Question 7 on differentiating a polynomial. A function f is defined in a simple domain by f of x is root x, 3x minus 2 over x root x. Find f dash 4. So we need to get it ready to differentiate. So f of x is equal to root x is x to the half, 3x minus 2 over x times x to the half. So we need to get that all tidied up first. So that is x to the half times 3x minus 2 over x to the 3 halves. And then we can take multiply our brackets out to get 3x to the 3 halves minus 2x to the half over x to the 3 halves. And tidying that up even further, f of x is 3x to the 3 halves minus 2x to the minus 1, a half minus 3 halves. Now we can differentiate it, f dash x, take the power down to the front, so it's 3 halves times 3, x to the, take 1 away from the power, so it's a half, minus times a minus a plus, so plus 2x to the minus 2. Tidying that back up because it was an uncalculated question, so we can substitute 4 in. We get f dash x is equal to 3 3 to 9 over 2 root x, x to the half, plus 2 over x squared. So now we need to substitute 4 in. So f dash 4 is equal to 9 over 2 root 4 plus 2 over 4 squared. That's 9 over 2 times 2 plus 2 over 16. That's just 9 plus an eighth. So we can just write 9 and an eighth if we want as our final answer. We have asked 2017 paper 1 question 8 on differentiating a polynomial. Calculate the rate of change of dt. d of t is equal to 1 over 2t. So we need to get it ready to differentiate. Always need to do that. So d of t is equal to 1 over 2 t to the minus 1. Do not be tempted to move this 2. That's just a half still. Separate it out. It's just a t that's moving. Once we do that, d dash t, take the minus 1 down. So we get minus a half t. Take away 1 from the power. We get minus 2. Then we have to work it out when t is 5. So d slash 5 is equal to minus a half times 5 to the minus 2, or minus 1 over 2 times 5 squared, minus 1 over 2 times 5 squared is 50, so minus a 50th. 
Just a note, remember, rate of change means differentiate. Okay, differentiate the trig function. S square higher maths to 18, paper 1, question 3. H of x is 3 cos 2x, find h dash pi over 6. So if h of x is 3 cos 2x, then h, straight away you can just do h dash x is equal to minus sine 2x, well minus 3 sine 2x, but then we need to times by 2 because we need to differentiate the 2x part as well. So that's minus 6 sine 2x. This is a paper 1 question, so it's an exact value question. So h dash pi over 6 is equal to minus 6 times sine 2 pi over 6. Sub it in. That equals minus 6 times the sine of pi over 3. Or if you prefer to work in exact values in degrees, that would be 60. So that equals minus 6, the sine of 60, root 3 over 2. 6 divided by 2 is 3, so it's minus 3 root 3. And we're done there. Okay, the chain rule, S degree higher maths, 2019, paper 1, question 6. Given that y equals 1 over 1, 1 minus 3x to the half, and x is not a third, find the y by the x. Let's get it ready to differentiate. So y equals... 1 minus 3x to the minus 5. So do y by dx minus 5 in the front. 1 minus 3x. Take away 1 from the power, so that's minus 6. And then times by whatever's in the bracket differentiated, which is minus 3. So tidying that up, we get minus 5 times minus 3 is 15. 1 minus 3x to the minus 6. And we're done there. One question 12 was given f of x is 4 sine 3x minus pi over 3, evaluate f dash pi over 6, or f dash differentiate your function at pi over 6. So, f dash x, we can check the front of the exam paper to realise that sine becomes cos when you differentiate it. So you should first of all start by writing 4 cos, 3x minus pi over 3. And just for doing that part without actually finishing the differentiation, which I'm going to do in a moment, gets you your first mark. For your second mark, you have to then realise that this is the chain rule. So you've got an inner function of 3x minus pi over 3. So you need to differentiate that and times the whole thing by that. So in other words, if I differentiate this part, that's the constant, so that's nothing. Differentiate 3x is 3, so I need to times by 3. So we get a second mark for realising that and writing down it, we're going to times by 3. And then our final mark, of course, is evaluating it. So I need to tidy it up and then substitute pi over 6 in. So f dash x equals 12 cos 3x minus pi over 3. So f dash of pi over 6. And this is an exact value, remember, because we are non calculator. But I'll substitute it in first. 12 cos 3 pi over 6 minus pi over 3. We need to tidy that up. So that's 12 cos 3 pi over 6 minus 2 pi over 6, which is 12 cos 3 minus 2 is 1, which so is pi over 6. Pi over 6, if you prefer to think in degrees, is 180 divided by 6, which is 30 degrees. So, it's the pi cos of 30. If you're not sure of what that is, let's draw an exact value triangle. If this was 60 degrees, that would be 30 degrees up here. This would be 2, this would be 1. 2 squared is 4, minus 1 squared is 1, so that gives you 3. So, we get the root 3. And we're looking at the cos, so it's opposite adjacent over hypotenuse, root 3 over 2. So you get 12 times the cos times root 3 over 2. 12 divided by 2 is 6, so you get 6 with root 3 as your final answer. And for all of that extra work, it's one extra mark. A bit stingy of the SQA there. So there's our there's our final mark at this point here. Increasing and decreasing functions, SQA, higher maths 2018, paper 2, question 3. A function is defined as a set of real numbers. 
given by f of x is x cubed minus 7x minus 6. Determine whether f is increasing or decreasing when x equals to 2. So we need to work out the gradient of the tangent at x equals to 2. So f dash x is equal to 3x squared minus 7. At x equal to 2, f dash of 2 in other words, we get 3 times 2 squared minus 7. That's 3 times 4 is 12. Take away 7 equals 5. And then we need to write a little statement. Since f dash of 2 is greater than 0, the function is increasing at x equal to 2. And we're done there. Next station reports on nature, SQ High Maths 2017, paper 2, question 7. Find the x coordinate of the station point on the curve with equation y equals 6x minus 2 root x cubed. Then find the greatest and least values of y in interval 1 is less than or equal to x and less than or equal to 9. So part A, station points are coming to y by the x is 0. So we need to get ready to differentiate. So with part A, I've got y equals 6x minus 2. I've got x cubed, so the cubed comes along for a ride, but it's a square root, so it's over 2. The y by dx then, 6 minus 2 times 3 over 2, x to the half, because I take away 1 from the power, and then we can say that stationary points occur when the y by dx equals 0. So making this equal to 0, we get 6. These twos cancel, so minus 3. x to the half equals 0. So 3x to the half equals 6. x to the half equals 2. Remember, x to the half means the square root of x equals 2. So I'm looking for, if I square both sides, I get x equals 4. And we're done there. Part B, hence determine the greatest and least values of y. So at x equal to 1, y equals 6 times 1 minus 2 times the square root of 1 cubed. 6 times 1, 6 minus 2 equals 4. At x equal to 9, the other one, y equals 6 times 9 minus 2 times the square root of 9 cubed. 6 times 9 is 54 minus the square root of 9 is 3, so 2 times 3 cubed. 54, 3 threes are 9 times 3 is 27. 27 times 2 is 54. That gives me a big 0 is the answer at the limits. So now I need to evaluate it at x equal to 4. So at x equal to 4, we've got y equals 6 times 4 minus 2 times the square root of 4 cubed. 24 minus 2 times, so the square root of 4 is 2, so 2 cubed. 24, 2 cubed is 8, times 2 is 16. 24 minus 16 is 8. So then we can just state our greatest and least values. The greatest value is 8, and the least value is clearly 0. So greatest... value equals 8, least value equals 0. And we're done there. The derived function, S square higher maths 2019 paper 2 question 5. The diagram below shows the graph of a cubic with station points at minus 2 and 4 as shown on the diagram of your answer book. Sketch the graph of g dash x, the derivative. Okay, so Let's just draw a picture here. Y and X. Now, we should first of all look at this. It's telling us it's a cubic. A cubic differentiates to a quadratic. So we're expecting a quadratic either going down the way or up the way. And we really just need to identify the roots. Well, the roots happen when the turning points because the derivative equals zero. So it's just, I need to know that stationary points occur when the Y by the X is zero which means that these are my roots. So I get a root at minus 2 and a root up at 4. So that means that if we examine before, before minus 2, it's going up the way. It's then dropping down the way 
and the derivative will be going back up the way. So it's above the x-axis before minus 2, it's below in between the roots, and it's above again after 4. So that's how I like to think of this. So I know I'm starting high, I'm dropping below between the numbers, and then I'm going high again, so my curve must come down like so. Obviously, I can't quite get the turning point. I know the turning point happens at 1 in the middle of the roots, but I don't know exactly what the, it would be on the y-axis, so I don't need to work that out. And there we are. There's my graph of the... It consists of a rectangle, a pond, surrounded by a path. The length and breadth for x and y, and the path is 1.5 metres wide at the pond ends, and 1 metre on the other sides, as shown. The total area of the pond and the path is 150. Show that the area of the pond is given by this equation. Well, we know the total area all the way around is x times y, or y times x. So we know, first of all, for part a to start with, that the area, total area, y times x, must equal 150, because it says so in the question, 150 square metres. If we go back up to the diagram, this distance here is going to be x minus 1.5 and 1.5, so 3. Similarly, going along the way, that distance there is going to be y minus, and you've got 1 and 1, so 2. So clearly the area of the pond part is y minus 2 times x minus 3. So the area of our pond, y minus 2 times x minus 3. We'll call that A. Now notice there's Y in here, but our question doesn't have any Ys, but we know that Y times X equals 150, so putting that back up there, Y is 150 over X. Keep that in mind, because we can substitute that in for Y later on. Let's multiply our brackets out here. A equals YX, or XY, minus 3Y, minus 2X, plus 6. Substituting our Y in, which is 150 over X, we get 150 over x times x minus 3, 150 over x minus 2x plus 6. So that simplifies to 150 minus 450 over x minus 2x plus 6. So 150 plus 6 is 156 minus 2x minus 450 over x. That's now a function of x, and that's exactly as required. So we've done part A. Part B, determine the maximum area of a pond. This is called an optimization question. So in this case, we need to differentiate it and find the stationary points. So A dash x, we're going to have minus 2, and if I take a little note up here, Minus 450 over x is minus 450x to the minus 1. So we've got minus 2, then plus 450x to the minus 2. Or, in other words, a dash x is minus 2 plus 450 over x squared. Clearly x cannot equal 0. So max or min... stationary points we're looking for. So we want to set a dash x equal to 0. So that gives us minus 2 plus 450 over x squared equals 0. So multiplying through by x squared to eliminate the fraction, we get minus 2x squared plus 450 is 0. So 2x squared equals 450 x squared is 225, and therefore x is the square root of 225, which gives us two answers, plus or minus 15. x squared equals 225, so x equals 15. We can discount the negative value based on the question, and do a nature table for just x equal to 15. So we've got x 
up to 15 and then at before 15 so at 15 we have got it being zero if we pick a value before 15 but not zero as you know then you will see that we'll have 450 over one take away two which is positive and if you pick a number after 15 let's just pick a massive number 100 if we did 450 over 100 squared that'd be a very small number take away two it's going to be a negative answer so it's negative so the max area a of x was equal to 156 minus 2x minus 450 over x so at 15 we get 156 minus 2 times 15 minus 450 over 15 that's 156 minus 30 minus 30 again which is 96 so meters squared Integrating a polynomial, x squared higher maths 2019, paper 2, question 2, integrate this polynomial. So we need to get it ready to integrate, just like with differentiation. So I'm going to change that to the integral of 6x to the half minus 4x to the minus 3 plus 5. And then we can integrate because we add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. So that gives me x to the 3 halves. Still times 6, but that's divided by 3 halves. We'll deal with that later. And then minus 4x to the minus 2. Minus 3 add 1 is minus 2. So divide by minus 2. Then plus 5x. And then remember to add your c. Okay, dividing by a fraction is the same as times by its reciprocal. So I can just do 6 times 2 is 12. So that's 12 over 3. x to the 3 halves. 4 divided by 2 is 2, minus divided by minus is a plus, so plus 2x to the minus 2, plus 5x, plus c. 12 divided by 3 is 4, so that's 4x to the 3 over 2, plus 2x to the minus 2, plus 5x, plus c. And you would get your final mark at that stage, but let's just assume you wanted to go further, because you're going to use it in a, another question. This helps us revise indices. Um, so we've got x to the 3 halves, so that's the same as x to the square root, because of the 2, x cubed, plus 2, x to the minus 2, over x squared, plus 5x, plus c. But you don't need to go that far for this question. Okay, Integrating a trig function again with a chain rule, we've got higher maths, 2019, paper 1, question 11. Evaluate the integral between 0 and pi over 9 of cos 3x minus pi over 6 dx. Exact value question as well because it's non-calculator. So let's start integrating. That becomes cos goes to sine, remember. We're looking at the start of the exam paper. The whole function 3x minus pi over 6. But then we need to differentiate this. Well, that's just a number, so that's nothing. That becomes 3. So divide by 3. And that is the integral between 0 and pi over 9. So there's our first step. Now we need to just substitute in. So that gives us a third of sine, well, 3 times pi over 9, we'll just write, minus pi over 6. That's our first one. Take away our second one, subbing 0 in. So that's a third sine 3 times 0 minus pi over 6. Okay, so we can now, we'll just tidy it up, put an extra bracket on. We can now just evaluate that. So that gives me 1 third. If I take my first one, sine 3 pi over 9. So let's just do this. 3 pi over 9 is pi over 3. So we've got pi over 3. And then our pi over 6, we can think of that as minus pi over 6. Take away a third of sine. And then 3 nothings is nothing, so it's just minus pi over 6. 
So that gives me one third of the sine of, well, pi over three is two pi over six, minus pi over six is pi over six. So I've just got pi over six now. Take away a third of the sine of minus pi over six. So we're gonna to have to work out what the sine of pi over six is. So uh, if you're thinking in degrees, pi over six is the same as 180 over six, which is 30 degrees. So exact value triangles is how I always think of this. So if I got myself a triangle with two on this side, one on that side, then by Pythagoras, two twos is four, minus one is three, that is root three. Now that was 60, so that one's 30. The sine of 30 degrees is equal to a half. You might have just memorized that yourself. If you think of a sine graph or a cast diagram, you can see that minus 30 would be about here. It's obviously minus a half for the sine of minus 30 degrees. One third of the sine of 30, so one third times a half, minus one third times minus a half. So a third times a half is a sixth, a third times minus a half is minus a sixth, so plus another sixth because of minus times a minus, that is two sixths, that is one third, and we're done there. SQA, higher maths 2022, paper one, question six. Integrate between minus five and two, 10 minus three x to the power of minus a half dx. Okay, let's start working on this. So we've got the integral of minus five and two of 10 minus three x to the power of minus a half dx. Well, we could start to integrate this by adding one to the power. So we've got 10 minus three x to the power of a half. They then need to divide by the bit inside the brackets differentiated. So inside the brackets is 10 minus 3x. If we differentiate that, you get minus 3. So we need to divide by minus 3, or in other words, that's the same as times it by minus a third. You get your first mark for just starting to do that, and you get your second mark for showing anywhere that you are going to be dividing by minus 3 or times and by minus a third. So there's your first two marks there. And then we need to process our limits. So we let's tidy this up a little bit before we get to that. So we get 10 minus 3x to the power of a half. Dividing by a half is the same as times and by two. We've got a minus because of the times and by minus a third divided by three. Now, our limits are two and minus five. So we've got minus two, 10, times minus three to the, times two to the power of a half divided by three. There's our first limit, and that is minus, minus two, 10, minus three times minus five to the power of a half divided by three. So there's our two limits because it's between minus five and two. So, your third mark is actually coming in at this point. For substituting in two and minus five and putting the minus in between, you are getting that mark. So there's your third mark there. And then your final mark is for actually working that out. So let's work that out now. Just being very careful. So we've got minus two, 10 minus six is four. So it's times the square root of four because the power of a half is square root and divided by three and that's minus. And then we've got minus two again. 10 minus three times minus five. Well, that's minus three times minus five is 15. So that's 10 add 15, which is 25. So it's times the square root of 25 over three. Working out that, we get minus two times two, which is minus four thirds, minus, minus two times five, which is minus 10 thirds, minus four plus 10 is six, so that's six thirds, 
which is equal to two in the end. So if we can get down to getting two, there's your final mark there for working that out. Okay, let's go through some key points of where you could go wrong in this question. If you differentiated and didn't integrate, unfortunately you get no marks at all, even if you're substituting numbers in, there's no way to get any marks for that. If you start to integrate individual terms, if we go back to the standard, the, the actual question, if you're trying to integrate, say, the 10 to get, like, 10x, and then the minus 3x to get something like minus 3 over 2x, you're just doing it inside the bracket, or you're trying to expand the bracket, you can't get any, any more marks after that as well, because it's just invalid, it doesn't work. For mark 4 down here, uh, it's only available for non-integer power. So in other words, if your power here, I've got a half as the correct answer, if you just squared or cubed or four, that we wouldn't get a mark because we're checking if you can do the third part as well. Taking with chain rule, x high maths, 18, paper one, question 14, find the integral between nine and minus four of this function. Gonna have to get it ready to differentiate first. So we've got between minus four and nine, one over. So it's the cube root, so that's to the power of a third, but it's squared, so it's to the power of two thirds. So it's 2x plus 9 to the power of 2 thirds dx, which equals the integral between minus 4 and 9, taking it up to the top, 2x plus 9 to the minus 2 thirds dx. And now we can integrate it. So we add 1 to the power and divide by the new power, so being very careful, we've got 2x plus 9, add 1 is a third, divide by our new power, so divide by a third, but also divide by this differentiated, which is 2. So I can say times 2 on the top bottom as well, and that is between minus 4 and 9, which I'll substitute in when I'm ready. Now this is a non calculator question, so I'm going to have to put it back into root form as well. So that gives me 2x plus 9 cube root. So I can just write the cube root of 2x plus 9. 2 times a third is 2 thirds. And that's between minus 4 and 9. Almost done. Dividing by a fraction means we can times it by the reciprocal. Flip it upside down in other words. So we get 3 times the cube root of 2x plus 9 over 2, between minus 4 and 9. And now I'm ready to substitute my numbers in. So substitute 9 in, take away, substitute minus 4 in. So subbing in my numbers, get 3 times the cube root of 2 times 9 plus 9, all over 2. I'll just put that in big brackets. Minus 3 times the cube root of 2 times minus 4 plus 9. I'll just make that clear that that's separate all over 2. And now we can work some of that out. So that's 3 times the cube root of 2 nines is 18, 18 and 9 is 27 over 2. Minus 3 times the cube root of 2 times minus 4 is minus 8, add 9 is 1, all over 2, and that's handy because that now simplifies quite easily. The cube root of 27, 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27, so this gives, just gives me 3 times 3 over 2, minus, cube root of 1 is 1, 3 times 1 over 2, that right, equals 9 over 2, minus 3 over 2, which equals 6 over 2, which equals 3. And we're done there. Differential equations, SQA Higher Maths, 2016, Paper 2, Question 9. For a function f defined of domain, suitable domain, f dash x is equal to this, and f of 9 is 4, if express f of x in terms of x. So again, it tells us that f dash x equals that, so if I integrate, I'm going to get f of x, so I just integrate the right. So I can just straight away say that f of x is the integral of 2x plus 1 over root x dx. Now I need to get that ready to integrate, sorry. So that is the integral of 2x 
plus 1 over x to the half dx. I can split that up into two separate fractions, 2x over x to the half plus 1 over x to the half dx. Um, integral of, so if that is a 1 power, 1 minus a half is just a half, so this simplifies to 2x to the half, and then that's plus x to the minus a half dx. So we can now integrate it, add 1 to the power, so we get x to the 3 halves, we've still got the 2, and we're going to divide by 3 halves in a minute. And then add 1 to the power of this, we get x to the half, divide by the new power, so divide by a half, but then we've got our plus c. And then this is f of x. Tidying that up a little bit, f of x is equal to Dividing by a fraction means that it's times by its reciprocal. So I do 2 times 2 is 4 over 3. So that's 4 thirds of x to the 3 halves. And 1 divided by a half is 2. So plus 2x to the half plus c. So there's our initial point, but then we need to find c because we're given some information. So we know that f of 9 equals 40. So in other words, that tells us that when x equals 9, f of x or y equals 40, we can just sub that in. So we get 40 for f of x equals 4 over 3. Now I'm going to change the x to the 3 halves to the square root of x cubed. So the square root of 9 cubed. And plus 2 times the square root of 9 plus c. Because this is actually, it's not a non calculator it's a calculator paper. But you can do it with that calculator anyway. So 40 equals 4 thirds. The square root of 9 is 3, so that gives me 3 cubed coming out, plus 2 times 3 plus c. Now use a calculator any time you want. 3 cubed is 27 divided by 3 is 9. 9 fours is 36. 2 threes is 6 plus c. So we get 40 is 42 plus c. And therefore, c is equal to minus 2. So then we can express our f of x. f of x is equal to 4 thirds x to the 3 halves. Plus 2x to the half. And it was plus c, so minus 2. Or if you've already changed it all, f of x is equal to 4 thirds of the square root of x cubed plus 2 times the square root of x, minus 2. Either of the options would be fine. Special equations, S3, Higher Maths 2015, paper 1, question 15. The rate of change of a mug of coffee is given by this differential equation. It tells you some information. Express t in terms of t. What you need to realise is if you integrate a dt by dt, you just get t back. So we can just immediately say that t equals the integral of the right-hand side, 1 over 25, t minus k and that will be with respect to t because it's dt instead of dx as normal. So we'll just integrate and let's go. So we get 1 over 25 t squared and then we times by a half because we divide by 2 and then minus k times t but then we've also got plus c. So there was our integral, let's just tidy that up. Dividing by a half, we get 1 over 50 t squared minus kt plus c. So there's our initial step, but then we need to eliminate that c, but luckily we're given some information. It says initially the temperature of the coffee is 100 degrees, 10 minutes later the temperature has fallen to 82 degrees. Express t in terms of t. So, First step, we know that initially, when t is 0, the temperature is 100. So we can say that when t equals 0, big T equals 100. Subbing all that in, we get 100 equals 0 minus 0 plus c. In other words, c equals 100. So we've now got t equals 150th of t squared minus kt plus 100, 
but we need to find this key. So we've got an extra bit of information. 10 minutes later, the temperature is 82. So in other words, when T equals 10, big T equals 82. Subbing that point in, we get 82 equals 1 50th of 10 squared minus K times 10 plus 100. So we just need to solve and get K back out. 82 equals 100 over 50 minus 10K plus 100. Just quickly running through this, you get 2 minus 10K plus 100. So you get 82 is 102 minus 10K. Moving the 10K over to this side to make it positive, that is 80, 102 minus 82 is 20. So K is 20 over 10, which is 2. So our final answer is just T is equal to 150th of T squared minus 2T because K is 2 then plus 100. I want done there. Question 4 says the graph has an equation x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8. The total shaded area bounded by the curve and the x-axis. We've got this area here and this area here. In the first part of the question, calculate the shaded area above the x-axis. So between minus 1 and 2. So for part A, we need to integrate between minus 1 and 2 our function x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8 dx. And that'll give us the area. So when x cubed becomes x to the power of 4 over 4, minus 5x cubed over 3, plus 2x becomes x squared, divided by 2, still x squared, plus 8x, and we're doing that between the limits of minus 1 and 2. So we need to substitute 2 in, take away, then substitute minus 1 in. So for our first bracket, we've got 2 to the power of 4 over 4, minus 5, 2 cubed, over 3, plus 2 squared, plus 8 times 2, Take away our second bracket, minus 1 to the power of 4 over 4, minus 5, minus 1 cubed over 3, plus minus 1 squared, plus 8 times minus 1. So let's work out each bracket separately, and I'm going to keep it as fractions, so that our answer is as nice as possible. I'm just using my calculator to get those fractions. So our first one, we have got 4, so the first term, minus 13 thirds, plus 4, plus 16. And we're taking away a quarter, plus 5 thirds, because it's minus times a minus, plus 1, take away 8. So for the first bracket, we would get 10 and 2 thirds minus the second bracket, which is minus 5 and a 12. So adding them together, you would get 15 and 3 quarters units squared as our area. Part B then says, hence calculate the total shaded area. So we've already got this bit, so we just now need to work out the integral between 2 and 4. And just a reminder, when you're wanting to work out an area when it's below as well, you would do this one, take away this one, and that will give you your total area. So for part B, we've got our integral already, between minus 1 and 2, of x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8. And we're going to take away the integral between 2 and 4 of the same thing. x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8dx. Just put that bit in brackets just to separate it out. And I'm going to do that bit first. I'm going to, I've already, I am going to. already know the answer to this bit. Let's just write that down. So that gives us 15 and 3 quarters minus... Let's just start integrating now. 
So we already know the answer to that, so there's no extra work required. It's a quarter of x to the 4 minus 5 over 3x cubed plus x squared plus 8x, and that's between 2 and 4. So keeping that 15 and 3 quarters just floating about, minus, let's just use big brackets, let's substitute our 4 in to start with. So we end up with 4 to the power of 4 over 4, minus 5 times 4 cubed over 3, plus 4 squared, plus 8 times 4. So that's our first limit. Take away our second limit, which in this case is 2, so it's a quarter, 2 to the power of 4, minus 5, 2 cubed over 3, plus 2 squared, plus 8 times 2. 15 and 3 quarters minus the first bracket at 64 minus 106 and 2 thirds plus 16 plus 32. That's this bracket here. In this bracket, we already know the answer to because we did it in part A, so we might as well just write down the answer. That was 10 and 2 thirds, so take away 10 and 2 thirds. Fifteen and three quarters minus first part of the bracket gives you five and a third minus ten and two thirds. So that means our area is fifteen and three quarters minus the answer to this minus five and a third. Minus, minus, so it's adding them together. So 15 and 3 quarters plus 5 and a third gives us a final answer of 21 and 112 units squared. Hi, there we are. Hey, Squee. Hi, Maths 2017, paper 1, question 10. Two curves of equation x cubed minus 4x squared plus 3x plus 1 and x squared minus 3x add 1 intersecting a diagram. Calculate the shaded area. To do shaded area between two curves, it's the upper curve minus the lower curve between the x's, which is 0 and 2. So I can immediately write down it is the integral between 0 and 2 of our upper curve minus our lower curve dx. So we can tidy that up before we integrate 0 and 2. We've only got an x cubed term, and then our x squared, 4 minus 4 minus 1 is minus 5x squared. Our x terms, 3x minus minus 3x is plus 6x. Watch your signs, and then 1 minus 1 is 0. So we get this integral to do. So that is x to the 4 over 4 minus 5x cubed over 3 plus 6x squared over 2 between 0 and 2. That's x to the 4 over 4 minus 5x cubed over 3 plus 3x squared between 0 and 2. So we can now substitute our numbers in. So that gives us 2 to the 4 over 4 minus 5 times 2 cubed over 3 plus 3 times 2 squared. There's our first bracket. Minus, and it should be clear that it's going to be 0, but just for the sake of completeness, 0 to 4 over 4, minus 5 times 0 cubed over 3, plus 3 times 0 squared. All that stuff separately is 0, so we're just left with our top bracket. 2 2's is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, divided by 4 is 4 for our first term. Second term, 2 cubed is 8, 8 5's is 40, so we get minus 40 over 3, and 2 squared is 4, times 3 is 12. Tidying that up, we get 16 minus 40 over 3. Non-calculator, easiest way to deal with that is mixed numbers, I would say, because 3 times 13 is 39, so minus 13 and a third. 16 minus 13 is 3, minus an extra third is 2 and 2 thirds. And we're done there. 
Pat Beaver say, says the line passing through the points of intersection of the curves has equation y equals 1 minus x. What fraction of the shaded area lies below the line? So we need to work out what the integral is below the line and see what fraction of the whole that is. You should, you should be able to guess what the answer should be just by looking at it, but you can't guess. You have to do it. So we're doing the integral of between 0 and 2. Our upper function is the line this time, so 1 minus x. Take away. The curve below the line is x squared minus 3x plus 1. dx. Alternatively, you could have done this minus a line and then with a fraction left over to make a complete whole. It's your choice. I'm going to do it this way. So that gives me the integral between 0 and 2 of 1 minus 1 is 0. I've got minus x minus minus 3x. So that's 3x minus x is 2x. Then I've got minus x squared as well. So you get 2x minus x squared, a nice simple function to integrate. So that gives you 2x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3 between 0 and 2. That gives you x squared minus x cubed over 3 between 0 and 2. So substituting 0 in, we get 2 squared, 2 in, so we get 2 squared minus 2 cubed over 3. Take away 0 squared minus 0 cubed over 3. That gives me 4 minus 8 thirds. That's 4 minus 2 and 2 thirds. That is 4 minus 2 is 2. Take away 2 thirds is 1 third. So one and a third. But if you go back to our original uh, question, the total area was two and two thirds. Remember our total area was equal to two and two thirds. It should be obvious that that is a half. So therefore a half of the area is below the line. And we're done there. The chain rule. X squared higher maths 2016, paper 2, question 10. Given that y was x squared plus 7 to a half, find the y by the x. And then part b, hence find the integral of this function, which we'll use our answer to part a to do. So part a, the y by the x is equal to, take the half down to the front, x squared plus 7, take 1 off the power, minus a half, and then we differentiate with a bit inside the brackets, which is x squared, so that becomes 2x. So that equals 2x divided by 2 is just x, so x bracket x squared plus 7 to the minus a half. And then try to make it look a bit like our part b, that's x over x squared plus 7 to the half, which is equal to x over the square root of x squared plus 7. Part B says integrate 4x over a square root of x squared plus 7, which is very similar. So if I do part B, integrate 4x over the square root of x squared plus 7 dx. Well, if I just take that 4 out, I get the integral of x over the square root of x squared plus 7 dx, which I already know is exactly the same as what I found out up here, my differential. This integrated is exactly that. So I can just write the integral as x squared plus 7 over half. Simple as that. So that means I've got my answer is 4 times x squared plus 7 to the power of a half. Or, I must make that neater, x squared plus 7 to the half. I've forgot my plus c, so there we are, plus c, and we're done there. SQA 2022 Higher Maths Paper 1, Question 7. Triangles A, B, C and A, D, E are both right angles. It tells us that angle B, A, C equals Q and D, E, E, D, A, E equals R. As shown in the diagram, calculate sine R, sine Q. So we can pull some information out of this diagram by drawing some triangles. So let me draw the small one first. If I do a little sketch, we've got R here. 
this whole length here is three and the whole length on the top is one. So by Pythagoras, three squared plus one squared equals 10. So that must be the square root of 10. We're gonna do the same for the Q triangle. If I just do that at the side, if I call this Q, then on the hypotenuse, we've got root 13, and on the bottom, we've got 2. So by Pythagoras, root 13 squared minus 2 squared is 13 minus 4, which is 9. So the square root of 9 is 3. So nice and simple then. Determine the value of sine r. Sine r opposite of the hypotenuse is 1 over root 10. And sine q opposite of hypotenuse is 3 over root 13. Two marks there. One, two. Nothing else you're going to do there. So let's go to part B. Okay, here's the term of the value of sine q minus r. Sine q minus r equals sine q cos r. Minus cos q sine r. From the start of the exam paper, you'll get that. So we need to work out our different things. So sine q is 3 over root 13. Well, cos r, well, we've already got r triangle here, so 3 over root 10. And minus cos q, which using this triangle is 2 over root 13. And we've got sine r, which we already know is 1 over root 10. Times in the tops of them, we get 9 over root 130 minus 2 over root 130, which is obviously 7 over square root of 130. Always double check if you can simplify that third at the end, but you can, and you don't have to rationalise the denominator for the marks because we're not examining that. So where do you get your marks for part B? If you go down sine Q cos R minus cos Q sine R, or you imply that by doing this, you get your marks. So there's mark one and two. Substituting in, three over root 13, three over root 10, minus two over root 13, times one over root 10 is your second mark. And then your final mark, obviously, for working it out as seven over root 130. So there's your final mark there. I'm asked, 2018, paper one, question 13, double angle formula and addition formula. The right angle triangle in the diagram is such that sine x is 2 over root 11. Find the exact value of sine 2x. Well, sine 2x is 2 sine x cos x. So I can write that, 2 sine x cos x. So I need to know my cos x, so let's go back to the triangle. Pythagoras to get this inside, so I've got root 11 squared, which is 11, minus 2 squared, which is 4, 11 minus 4, 10, 9, 8, 7. So the missing side is the square root of 7. So that means I've got cos x is equal to root 7 over root 11. So that's 2 times 2 over root 11 times root 7 over root 11. 2 times 2 is 4, so I get 4 root 7 on the top. Root 11 times root 11 is just 11, so 4 root 7 over 11. So for part 2, cos 2x is 2 cos squared x minus 1, using the start of the formula seat. So that's 2 times, well, cos x, remember, was root 7 over root 11. I'm going to square that and then take away 1. That's 2 times root 7 squared is 7, root 11 squared is 11, minus 1. 2 sevens is 14 over 11, take away 1. 14 over 11, take away 1, so take away 11 basically is 3 elevenths. So we get 3 over 11 as our answer for part 2. Part B, by expressing sine 3x as sine 2x plus x, find the exact value. So sine... 2x plus x, this is the addition formula now, so start of the exam paper, sine 2x cos x plus cos 2x sine x. Now we have already worked out sine 2x and cos 2x at the top, so just using our answers, sine 2x is 4 root 7 over 11. 
cos x was root 7 over root 11 plus cos 2x was 3 elevenths and sin x we already know is 2 over root 11. So putting that together, we get 4 on the top. Root 7 times root 7 is just 7 over 11 times root 11 plus 3 times 2 is 6 over 11 root 11. 4 7 is 28 over 11 root 11 plus 6 over 11 root 11. That's the common denominator, so I can just add them straight away. 28 and 6 is 34 over 11 root 11. And we could just leave our answer there. Integrating a trig function, which also ties in with the chain rule. So we've got S square high maths 2015, paper 2, question 7. Part A, find the integral of 3 cos 2x add 1. So we've got the integral of 3 cos 2x plus 1 dx. You don't need to divide a headache here. If you check the start of the exam paper, it tells you if you integrate cos, you get sign. So I know what that's going to give me sign. So we've got 3 sin 2x, the 1 integrates 2x, but we'll get there in a minute because you need to be careful here. This is not cos x, it's cos 2x, so the chain will apply, sorry, you differentiate 2x to get 2, and you then divide by it, or, so it's divided by 2, and now I can integrate the 1, so it's plus x, and then I've got a plus c on the end. So just tidying that up a little bit, I could write that as 3 over 2, sine 2x plus x plus c. And we're done there. Part b says show that 3 cos 2x add 1 equals 4 cos squared x minus 2 sine squared x. So it's a trigonometric question. We have to use our cos 2x expansion from the start of the exam paper. So part b, 3 cos 2x plus 1. I'm going to try and make that look like the right hand side. So cos 2x. I'm going to expand to cos squared x minus sine squared x. And that's still plus 1. So that's 3 cos squared x minus 3 sine squared x plus 1. Let's see what we're trying to make it look like. Well, there's no actual... 1 in the question, so we're going to change 1 in a funny way, because 1 is sine squared x plus cos squared x. So taking that 1 out, we get 3 cos squared x minus 3 sine squared x plus sine squared x plus cos squared x. 3 cos squared x plus cos squared x is 4 cos squared x, and minus 3 plus 1 is minus 2 sine squared x. And we should be done there. The okay, part C integrate sine squared x minus 2 cos squared x dx. We're going to use our result that we just found out because that looks very similar to this result. So let's have a look at what this result was. It was 3 cos 2x add 1. So as an aside, 3 cos 2x plus 1 was equal to 4 cos squared x minus 2 sine squared x. If I divide this by 2 then, I would get 2 cos squared x minus sine squared x. So let's just do that to start with, just so you can see what's happening. Divide by 2 on both sides. We would get 3 over 2 cos 2x minus a plus a half equals 2 cos squared x minus sine squared x. But this is um, the opposite signs on, on here. So if I then divide through by minus 1 or move everything to the left hand side I suppose there's another way to think of it then you get minus 3 over 2 cos 2x minus a half equals minus cos squared x minus 2 cos squared x plus sine squared x which is exactly what I'm trying to integrate so if I can, I can integrate my left hand side. So my integral becomes the integral of minus 3 over 2 cos 2x minus a half dx. So that equals 
minus 3 over 2 cos goes to sine, so sine 2x. And you need to differentiate with 2x to get 2 and divide by 2. So I'm dividing the whole thing by 2. A half minus a half goes to minus a half x, and we've got plus c. Dividing a fraction by a number means I can just times the denominators. So we get minus 3 sine 2x over 4 minus a half of x plus c. And we're done there. S3 Higher Maths 2017 Paper 2 Question 11 Trigonometric Identities Part A Show that sine 2x over 2 cos x minus sine x cos squared x equals sine cubed x. So the way to deal with these is just keep it separate, start dealing with the left and start making it equal to the right hand side. You may have to manipulate the right hand side separately as well so you get two different things equal, but in this case probably not. So let's look at the left hand side, we've got sine 2x, we can write that as 2 sine x cos x, just using the start of the exam paper, over 2 cos x, and then we've got minus sine x cos squared x. So we can cancel the 2s, and we can cancel the cos x's from here, so that leaves just sine x for this one, minus sine x times cos squared x. Sine x is a common factor in this case, so that gives me sine x bracket 1 minus cos squared x. And if you're paying attention, you would realize that 1 minus cos squared x is also equal to sine squared x. Just check the, the exam paper. Sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. So that means I can say that that is sine x times sine squared x, which is equal to sine cubed x as required. Okay, part B, hence differentiate sine 2x over 2 cos x minus sine x cos squared x between 0 and pi over 2. So if we're going to differentiate that, we can just differentiate the right hand side because it's equal to it. So for part B, d by dx of the left hand side equals d by dx of what we just found out, sine cubed x. Now, sine cubed x, remember, means the sine of x squared. So it's easier to write it like that to see exactly what you're doing. So if I just write sine of x, that's to be cubed. So I have to differentiate sine x all cubed. So that's the chain rule. So the chain rule says I take the power down to the front, I leave the function alone, so it's sine x and then I take one away from the power, so that's squared. But then I need to differentiate the inner function, which is sine x. Check the start of the exam paper, sine x goes to cos x, so times by cos x. Tidying that up, that's 3 sine squared x cos x, and we're done there. We've got express 4 sine x plus 5 cos x in the form k sine x at a, where k is greater than 0, and a is between 0 and 2 pi. Notice it's in radians, so I'll just work in radians for this question, and then we'll have to solve the equation. Okay, let's do this. So part a, if I take k sine x at a, I can expand that straight away. Check the front exam paper if you're unsure, you'll get k sine x cos a plus k cos x sin a. So that means that 4 sin x plus 5 cos x equals k sin x cos a plus k cos x sin a. Well, 4 sin x that's already got a sine x here, so that means that k cos a must equal 4. Similarly, we've got on this side cos x and this side cos x, so whatever's left, k sine a must equal 5. Sine divided by cos remembers tan, so if I divide at this moment in time, we'll get tan a straight away equals 5 over 4. 
we should check which quadrants A is going to be in. And we can do that by checking our original equations. This is positive, so we've got cos A. This is positive, so we've got sine and A. That means that the tan of this will only be positive on A because that's about to, the one that's ticked twice. So we're using the first quadrant, that's nice and easy, so we can work out A straight away. A is the inverse tan of 5 over 4. 0 0.896. So we've got our A. Now we need to work out our K. But sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. So that means that 4 squared plus 5 squared equals K squared. So 4 squared plus 5 squared equals K squared. 16 plus 25 is k squared, so 41 equals k squared, which means k must be the square root of 41. And I'll just leave it as a third. As long as it's simplified, that's fine. Or you could just square root 41 in your calculator, and you'll get 6.4, but better off with an exact value. So then just to answer the question, remember the question was expressed in the form k sine x add a, so as k sine x add a, we've got k sine x plus 0 0.896. Question 3b, hence solve 4 sine x plus 5 cos x equals 5.5 for x between 0 and 2 pi. So we've already worked out what we've got root 41 sine of x plus 0 0.896. That's our left-hand side, and that equals 5.5. So we can divide through by root 41, so that the sine of our angle plus 0 0.896 is just 5.5 over the square root of 41. So we can work out if what quadrants we should be in with our cast diagram. So sine is positive, so we're in the first quadrant and the second quadrant, which reminder is going to be pi minus our angle. So we now need to work out our angle using the inverse sine in a calculator of 5.5 over root 41. If you do that in a calculator you get 1.033. So in our first quadrant that means that x plus 0 0.896 remember equals 1.033. So taking away 0 0.896, we get x equals 0 0.137 as our first answer. Let's look at our second answer on our second quadrant. Remember that means that we've still got x plus 0 0.896, because that's our whole angle, but that equals pi minus, remember it was 1.033. So x must be pi minus 1.033 minus 0 0.896, which gives us a second answer of 1.213. So we've got our two answers for x between 0 and 2 pi. Remember, I was working in radians there. S Grey High Maths 2015, Paper 2, Question 9 for the addition and double angle formula. The winds of a turbine are turning at a steady rate. The height h of the tip of one of the blades above the ground at any time t seconds is given by the formula. Express 36 sine 1.5t minus 15 cos 1.5t in the form k sine 1.5t minus a. So we can write 36 sine 1.5t minus 15 cos of 1.5t equals well, k sine 15t minus a. k sine 1.5t, sorry, minus a. So expanding the right-hand side, that's going to equal k sine 1.5t cos a minus k sine 
a cos 1.5t. If we look at what's in front of sine 1.5t here, we get 36. So 36 equals what's in front of sine 1.5t on this side, k cos a. And similarly, looking at what's in front of cos 1.5t on this side is minus 15. And in front of cos 1.5t on this side is minus k sine a. To rewrite that nice, more nicely then, I can say that k cos a equals 36 and k sine a equals 15. And now we're ready to get our k. Because sine squared plus cos squared equals 1, that means our k squared will be 36 squared plus 15 squared. So in other words, k is equal to the square root of 36 squared plus 15 squared, a bit like Pythagoras. So that is the square root of 1521. Use your calculator to verify that. And the square root of 1521 is 9, 39. So we know that k is equal to 39. And also we can work out our a because sine divided by cos is tan. So since tan a is sine a over cos a, I can write tan a is equal to 15 over 36. So I can find the inverse tan of 15 over 36. Inverse tan of 15 over 36, making sure my calculator is in radians, is 0 0.395. And now I just need to check which quadrant our angle is in. So drawing a cast diagram would help with this. Now remember, we're going back and looking at what cos and sine were. Well, we're both positive. So cos was positive, so that's A and C. And sine is positive, so that's a and c. So I'm in the first quadrant, so that means that a equals 0 0.395. And therefore, to answer our question, we get 39 sine 1.5t minus 0 0.395. And we're done there. So to follow on this question, it then says, and hence find the two values which tip a blade is at a height of 100 metres above the ground during the first turn. So we've just expressed this in this form, but then you've got plus 65 on the end. So we can just write that again, plus 65, and that's going to equal 100. So I'll go ahead and do that. So that means, I'll just call this part 2, our h equals 39 sine 1.5t minus 0 0.395 plus 65, and that's going to equal 100. So we've just got an equation to solve now. That means I can take 39 with 65 across, so we get 39 sine 1.5t minus 0 0.395 equals 35. So dividing through by 39, we get sine 1.5t minus 0 0.395 equals 35 over 39. So at this point, I can find the inverse sine of 35 over 39 using a calculator and get a value. The inverse sine of 35 over 39 is 1.114. And looking at our cast diagram, sine is positive, so it's in the first and second quadrant, so that's pi minus the answer. So we can also do pi minus 1.114 to get a second solution and that is going to be 2.03 so that means we can say that this whole, the whole of this equals that and the whole of this equals that and solve for t so 1.5 t minus 0 0.395 equals 1.114 and 1.5 t minus 0 0.395 equals 2.03. So solving the first equation, 1.5t adding 0 0.395, we get 1.509. And therefore t is 1.509 divided by 1.5, 1.006. There's our first solution. And our second solution, 1.5t equals 2.03 plus 0.395, which is 2.425. And therefore, t dividing through by 1.5, 1 1.617. Just put my units in here, so that's seconds and that's seconds. 
and we're done there. Twenty twenty two paper one question nine for higher math says solve the equation cos two x is five cos x minus three for x between zero and three sixty, but not including three sixty. So this is a standard trig equation question where we have to use a double angle formula. So if we check the start of our exam paper, cos 2x is 2 cos squared x minus 1. That's the one I'm going to use because the other side's got cos x on it as well. So changing that to 2 cos squared x minus 1 equals 5 cos x minus 3. And there we are, we get our first mark just for doing that. There we go, nice and Easy that one for just using the correct one. And then we need to express it as a quadratic, which has got a cos a squared in it. So we've got 2 cos squared x degrees minus 5 cos x degrees minus 1. Then add another 3 is plus 2. And that equals 0. So if we can get that far, there's our second mark there. And then we need to factorise it. So double brackets. This is just like an x and an x, but except it's a cos x and a cos x. And we're going to have 2 cos x for one of them, because it's 2 cos x times cos x is 2 cos squared x. And it has to be 2 and 1. So you just have to work out which way it goes. Well, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. So I can go 2 and 1 there. And then getting our signs around the right way. It's a positive at the end, so we either have to be both negative or both positive. And an easy way to work that out is the middle term is negative, so we're both negative. So there we are. We get a mark for working that out. Okay, let's look at our fourth mark. We need to solve our equations. So if we left the first one, we've got 2 cos x minus 1 equals 0. Or we've got cos x equals 2. Solving the left hand side, cos x degrees equals 1 half. We've got cos x degrees equals a half, so we're going to have to work out um, x. So it's an exact value. So if you're not sure how you can do an exact value triangle, so if we had 60 degrees and 30 degrees, that'd be 2, that'd be 1, and that'd be about 3. And you should be able to see that the cos of 60 is a half because it's adjacent of a hypotenuse. So x degrees equals inverse cos of a half, which is equal to 60 degrees. And because of cast diagram, we can say that we've got the first and fourth quadrant. So x degrees also equals 300. And there's our two solutions for the left-hand side. Now, looking at our right-hand side, nice and simple, cos x is equal to 2. There's no solutions to that. So we can just say there's no solutions because, obviously, cos x goes between 1 and minus 1. So for our final mark in this question, as long as we've got 60 and 300 and said no solutions, so all of this underlined stuff together gives us our final fifth mark. Trigonometric equations, SQA Higher Maths 2019, paper 1, question 15. Solve the equation sine 2x plus 6 cos x equals 0. And then solve a new equation for part b. So for part a, sine 2x plus 6 cos x, a sine and a cos, they're different from each other. So I'll expand the sine 2x to give me 2 sine x cos x. And this time we're working in degrees, plus 6 cos x equals 0. So although we've got a sine and a cos, there is a common factor, so I can factorise. So the common factor is cos x, but it's also got a number attached. 2 is also a common factor, so 2 cos x goes outside. That gives me sine x in the bracket here. And 2 cos x times 3 is 6 cos x, so plus 3 equals 0. And then we've just got two equations to solve. We can say 2 cos x equals 0, or we can say sine x plus 3 degree, plus 3 equals 0. This one gives me sine x is equal to minus 3, which has no solutions, because the maximum and minimum of sine x is 1 and minus 1. So this one, 2 cos x equals 0, means that cos x also must be 0. 
you should know that cos x is equal to 0 at 90 degrees. If you don't, there's a little graph for you just to prove it. 1 and minus 1, it goes along 90, then 180, then 270. So we can immediately say that x equals 90 degrees. You could also say it's 270 straight away, but if you didn't know it was 270, cast diagram would give you the other one because cos is positive. So 360 minus 90 would give you your 270 as well. And we're done there for part A. Part B says, hence solve sine 4x plus 6 cos 2x equals 0. Part B, sine 4x plus 6 cos 2x equals 0. So part A was sine 2x plus 6 cos x. So the numbers in front haven't changed, so it's not a multiple. However, the angles have just doubled, so the frequency has just doubled. So that means that our answers to part A was when x equals 90 and 270. So now it's just 2x equals 90 and 270. There's no real extra, there's no real extra work to do. So for part B, I can just say straight away, 2x degrees equals 90 degrees and 270 degrees. But I want to solve it between 0 and 360. So there's going to be more solutions than that because I'm going to divide my answers by 2. So I just add 360 to everything. I'll just write that here, plus 360. Then it's going to give me 450 degrees. And it's also going to give me 630 degrees. And then I can just divide each of them by 2 to get 45 degrees, to get 135 degrees, to get 225 degrees, and the final one is 315 degrees. And we're done there. So for weighted functions, this we high mass 2015 paper 1 question 4. The diagram shows the graph of a function y equals p cos qx plus r. So it's a trig graph. I write down the values of p, q and r. Okay, so we need to start off with what this function is. The normal cos graph, if you remember, goes between 1 and minus 1, like so, and it goes up to 2 pi. So the number in front is called the amplitude, then the period of how, the frequency, and then how far it's moved up or down. So immediately we can see that if we look at the Q first, we've got 1 up to pi over 2, which means if I was to keep drawing that, I would have... 4 up to 2 pi, because pi over 2 is 90 anyway. So I can immediately write down that q equals 4, because I should have 4 of them up to 2 pi. Okay, to get our amplitude, if we just work out the difference between the maximum and minimum, I've got 4 and minus 2 is 6, so to get p, I can just do 4 to minus 2 is 6, half of that is 3, so I get 3. p is 3. And then for r, well, now I've got p, it's easy. If, if it was just 3 cos x, it would go up to 3, but it starts at 4, so I've added 1. So r is just equal to 1. And we're done there. We've worked down the values of p, q, and r. Now, what's the function is 3 cos 4x plus 1. The function is SVHI Maths 2017, paper 1, question 14. First part was a trig question, and then it moved on to having to draw a graph. So for part A, using our knowledge of trig, we have got root 3 sine x minus cos x. And we have to write it in the form k sine x minus a. So we expand that using the formula sheet. That's k sine x cos a. Minus k cos x sine a. Okay, so then we would just uh, write, equate the parts to each other. So if we look at the sine x first of all, we've got k sine x cos a, so that means that k cos a equals root 3. So I can just write that, k cos a equals root 3. And similarly, looking at the cos x part, which is over here, we've got minus k sine a equals minus 1. So we can just write k sine a equals 1. k sine a equals 1. So that means that our k, because sine squared x plus cos squared x equals 1, gives us the square root of root 3 squared plus 1 squared. 
So that is the square root of 3 plus 1, which is the square root of 4, which is 2. So our k equals 2. And then to get your a, so to get our a, remember sine divided by cos is tan, so I can write tan a is equal to the sine, which is 1 over the cos, which is root 3. So that's an exact value for tan a, because we've got a right angle triangle, and if you had 60 here and 30 here, you would have 2, 1 and root 3. So the tan of 30 is 1 over root 3. We need to use a cast diagram just to confirm. So if we look at our cast diagram, we need to check our original functions. Cos was positive, so that would be these two. And sine was positive, that would be these two. So yes, we're in the first quadrant, because we're two ticks in A. So that means I can just say, therefore, A equals 30 degrees. And then our final answer is 2 sine x minus 30 degrees. And we're done there. So for part B, we have to draw the graph, but we've already put it in this form. So we're just going to draw the graph of y equals 2 sine x minus 30. So I know my amplitude is 2, so it's going to go between 2 and minus 2. And minus 30 tells me that it's shifted to the right by 30 degrees. So drawing a nice sketch of that, I can note on the y-axis the points 2 and minus 2. And then we're going to start at 30 degrees because we've shifted along. So we can just start drawing our graph and stop about there because it's not, it only goes up to 360. We can note our turning point. So normally it goes along to 90, but shifted to the right by 30 means that this point is 120. So 122. And similarly, this is usually 270 on a sine graph, so an extra 30 makes 300. So we've got 300 and 2. Uh, the other thing we could do is make sure you go back to 0, so you have to draw what's going to happen here. So it's just going to continue. We could know, notice where it cuts the y-axis. So it's going to cut the y-axis here, which is when x is 0. If you put 0 into this, you get the sine of minus 30, which is minus a half, times 2 is minus 1, so you could note minus 1 there. And there you go, you've drawn a sketch of the graph. You could tidy that up a little bit. Okay, evaluating numerical expressions, SQA Higher Maths 2019, paper 1, question 14. Part A, evaluate log 10, 4 plus 2 log 10, 5. So we've got log 10, 4 plus log 10, 5 squared, because I can take the 2 up. So that's log 10, 4 plus log 10, 25. And then we can combine that because we can times the numbers together. So it's log 10, 4 times 25, which is log 10, 100. Log 10, 100 is equal to 2 because 10 squared equals 100. And there we are. Part B, solve log 2, 7x minus 2 minus log 2, 3 equals 5. So we'll combine that into one log straight away by writing log 2, 7x minus 2 all over 3. Because a minus means we can divide. And that equals 5. So then using our rules of logs to eliminate, we've got a log on one side and a number. So 2 to the power of 5 equals this. So I can write that, 2 to the power of 5 is 7x minus 2 over 3. So we need to work out 2 to the power of 5. Well, 2 2 is 4 times 2 is 8 times 2 is 16 times 2 is 32. So we get 32. So 32 equals 7x minus 2 over 3. So we can times 32 by 3. 32 times 3 is 96. So 96 is 7x minus 2. Add 2 to both sides, so 98 is equal to 7x. Dividing through by 7 then, you get 14 equals x, or nicer, x equals 14. And we're done there. Okay, value in numerical expressions for logs, SQA Higher Maths 2016, paper 1, question 14. Part A, evaluate log 5, 25, 2. Because remember, that means 5 squared equals 25. It's as simple as that. Part B. 
Hence, solve log 4x plus log 4x minus 6 equals log 525. So looking at our left-hand side, we combine, combine that into one log by saying that it's x times x minus 6. So I'll do that to start with. Log 4x bracket x minus 6. And the right-hand side, log 525, well, we know that's 2, so we can just write 2. So then we can use our rules of logs to say that it's the base to the power of 2 equals the left-hand side. So in other words, 4 squared equals x times x minus 6 to eliminate the log. Now we're just going to get a quadratic, 16 equals x squared minus 6x. Moving over to the same side, you get x squared minus 6x minus 16 equals 0. So you've got a quadratic to solve. Hopefully that's factorizable. x and x, 8 and 2. Minus 8 plus 2, because minus 8 plus 2 is minus 6. Minus 8 times 2 is minus 16. So that gives me x equal to minus 2 or x equal to 8. But x equal to minus 2 is not a valid answer because the log of 0 or anything negative is undefined. So x has to be greater than 6. So we can just score that out and say that x has to be greater than 6 is the answer. So our final answer is x equal to 8. And we're done there. Solving logarithmic equations, SQA Higher Maths 2017, paper 1, question 12. Given log A 36 minus log A 4 equals a half, find the value of A. So we use our rules of logs to combine the logs. So that can give me log base A. And we've got 36 divided by 4 because of the minus equals 1 half. So log base A, 36 divided by 4 is 9, equals a half. So eliminating the log. A to the power of a half equals 9. A to the half equals 9. So that means the square root of A, we could write that, I suppose, equals 9. So if I square both sides, A equals 81. And we're done there. So our exponential equations, S square higher mass 2016, paper 2, question 6, otherwise known as experimental data with exponentials. Scientists is studying the growth of a bacteria strain. The number of bacteria given is B equals 200E to the 107T. State the number of bacteria present at the start of the study. The start means t is zero. You can either remember then that, that gives you e to the nothing, which is one, so you get 200, or you can write that out, actually. So at the start, t equals zero. So b of t equals 200, e to the 0 0.107 times zero. That's 200 times e to the zero, which is just 200. Calculate the time taken for the bacteria to double for part B. So if it doubles, that means that B of T becomes 400. So I can then write 400 as our B equals 200. E of a 0 0.107 T was our equation. And we need to solve that. So I'll divide by 200. 400 by 200 is 2, which is what you should get. E of a 0 0.107 T. Now we can take the log of both sides, the natural log, so log 2 or log e2 equals log of e to the 0 0.107t, or if you prefer log e. Taking it down as a power, so you get log 2 equals 0 0.107t times log e of e, which is just 1. So log 2 equals 0 0.107t. Divide through by 0 0.107, t equals log 2, divided by 0 0.107. Get your calculator out and you will get about 6.48, so 6.48 hours, because hours was our unit of time. Question 10, the heptathlon was an athletics contest made of seven events. Athletes score points for each event. In the 200 metres event, points are calculated using this formula, where p is the number of points and t is the athlete's time in seconds. Calculate how many points are awarded for a time of 24.55 seconds in the 200 metres event. So we just need to substitute 24.55 in for T. So we've got P equals 4.99087, 42.5 minus 24.55 to the power of 181. 
that's 4.99087 times 17.95 to the power of 1.81. Nine two nine point O three six eight Let's just make that nine two nine point zero four. It doesn't quite specify whether the points are whole numbers or not, so that seems reasonable given the accuracy of the rest of the question. Right, and the long part B in the long jump event, points are calculated using this formula, where P is the points, D is the distance in, K, in centimetres, and K is a constant. It says 850 points are awarded for a jump of 600, calculate K, so we'll just substitute in and work from there. So we've got P, which is 850, equals 0 0.188807. D is 600, minus 210, to the power of K. So 850 equals 0 0.188807, 390 to the K. So dividing through, we get 850 over 0 0.188807 equals 390 to the power of k. Log in both sides. I'll just use the natural log. Taking the k to the front then. equals log of 850 over 0.188807 divided by the log of 390. So it's time to get a calculator to work these out. 1.40999, so k equals 1.41. Solving logarithm equations, S square higher maths for 18, paper 1, question 11. Diagram shows log 3x on the diagram in the answer book. Sketch the curve of equation 1 minus log 3x and then find the point of intersection between the curves which will be solved with logarithmic equations. So 1 minus log 3x, the minus part here tells me to reflect in the x-axis and then the 1 part, which I'll do in another colour here, tells me to then move up by 1. So first of all, reflecting on the x-axis, this point will stay where it is, but this point will jump down here, and that would be at the moment as a, as a point 3 minus 1. But now I have to move up by 1, so this point is going to jump up by 1, so that becomes 1, 1, and you can see this point goes up to 3, 0, so I can just write the number 3 here. Getting rid of my intermediate working, which you could use a rubber if you are doing this by hand and since it's reflected it's going to go down and through here so we can just draw that in down here through the way and there we go it's a reflection in the x-axis okay part b determine the exact value of the point of intersection simultaneous equations so for part b we've got y equals log 3x but we've also got y equals 1 minus log 3x so we can say that they are equal to each other and find x. So log 3x equals 1 minus log 3x. So taking the log 3x to the other side, you'll have log 3x plus log 3x. So two of them, 2 log 3x equals 1. I can take the, power, the 2 up as a power, so I get log 3x squared equals 1. Now I've got it in the form log of something equals a number. So 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared. 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared, and therefore I can find x. x equals 
3 to the power of a half, or x equals the square root of 3. And we're done there. Notice it'll only be the positive part of this instead of the negative part, because if x was negative, then you'd have log of a negative number, which doesn't exist, so it's just a positive. I can take a note of that. Just positive value, as x has to be greater than 0. Question 7 says, two variables x and y are connected by the equation y equals kx to the n. The graph of log 5y and log 5x is shown as a straight line. Calculate the values of k and n, and we're obviously given two points. So let's start this question. So we've got y equals kx to the n, and we've got the log base 5, so we can log both sides with base 5. So log base 5y equals log base 5kx to the n which we can separate into two separates, log base 5y equals log base 5x to the n, plus log base 5k. Bringing the n down in front, we've got log 5y equals n log 5x plus log 5k. That's a bit like, because it's logarithmic log base 5x and log base 5y, that's a bit like a big y equals mx plus c. So that's our gradient and that is our y-intercept. So, so we can work out our gradient because we're given two points in the question. Just remind ourselves 0, 3 and 2 minus 1. So our gradient equals minus 1 take away 3 over 2 take away 0. That's minus 4 over 2, which is minus 2. We can then do our y-intercept. That's c, remember. So c was log 5k. So that crosses the y-axis at the number 3. So that means that 5 cubed equals k, so 125 equals k. So to answer our question, we had y equals kx to the power of n, so y is 125x to the minus 2, where k equals 125 and n equals minus 2. The relation from a straight line for logarithmic graphs x squared high mass 2019 paper 2 question 12. Two variables x and y are connected by the equation and this is what you're looking for y equals a b to the x a power and we're looking at one of the axes is logged but the other one is not. So it's only one log this time but always start from your equation and get the logs coming out and see where you go. So I'll start with y equals a b to the x with the find the values of a and b. So let's start with y equals a b to the x. Just log both sides then. Our log base is 4, so looking on our graph, log base 4y equals log base 4 of a, b, the x, which is a product. So I can separate that into a plus. So log base 4y equals log base 4 of b, the x. I like the x one first, like mx plus c, plus log base 4a. Taking the x to the front, we get log base 4y. That's a y and that's a log, equals x times log base 4b plus log base 4a. Well, let's, y equals mx plus c is a straight line, so let's put the x on the end so you can really see it. Log base 4y equals log base 4b times x plus log base 4a. So that's like y equals mx plus c. So we can see our a gradient is equal to this number in front of x and our c is equal to this. So we can say our gradient is equal to log 4b. So let's just check our graph to see if we can work out the gradient. We're given two points. So our gradient is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So that's 8 minus minus 1 over 3 minus 0. That's 9 over 3, which is 3. So we know our gradient's 3, so log base 4b equals 3. Remember that means that 4 to the power of 3 equals b.
4 cubed is b, 4 cubed is 64, and therefore b equals 64. Now let's try our c. From the work we've just done, our c is equal to log base 4 of a. C is where it cuts the y-axis. We know it cuts the y-axis at 0, minus 1, so C is minus 1. So we can just straight away say that minus 1 is equal to log base 4 of A, or if you prefer log base 4A equals minus 1. Remember that means 4 to the power of minus 1 equals A. Let's write that straight away. 4 to the minus 1 equals A. 4 to the power of minus 1 is 1 over 4 to the power of 1. So therefore, A equals one quarter, and we're done there.